All right, all right. Thank you for joining me in this episode of the Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marla Wilson, and we have another fantastic show for you today. Another fantastic debate. I hope you guys are ready for it. We have a two-on-two debate. I have Jeremiah Nortier, I have uh, Trey Fisher, I have Zachariah Finberg, and I have Andrew Curl with me, and we're going to be debating, is baptism necessary for the forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future? And so I hope you guys are ready for this debate, because it's going to be an ex exciting, exciting, exciting debate. But before I bring the guys in, I do want to make sure you know to subscribe to the Gospel Truth. Hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you miss out any shows that are coming up here in the future on the gospel truth don't miss out anything hit the subscribe button please do it now do it now and if you don't know the gospel truth is not only on youtube but facebook twitter x instagram and tiktok so make sure you subscribe and follow on those respective social media platforms as soon as you can do that and support the ministry with a follow a like if you can also all this content is not only on video but also audio itunes google play spotify so flow over to those podcasts and platforms and subscribe and follow on those podcasting platforms if you can and as always i do have some shows that are coming up here in the future that i want to make sure you guys are aware of all right coming up after this debate i have cj cox and jp they're going to be joining me uh, does god decree all things it should be a fun one a very controversial very exciting can get heated at times but i'm sure everyone will be looking forward to this one hopefully you guys are getting ready for it after that i have radar and jason jumping in and they're going to be debating, does the Torah, does, is the Trinity in the Torah? Is, is it implied in the Torah? Or things like that. So it should be a fun debate. Hopefully you guys are looking forward to it. And uh, I mean, I'm looking forward to it as well. This will be Radar and Jason's first time on the Gospel Truth. Then after that, I have Dr. Michael Burgos and Brandon Nero going to be jumping on. Is Jesus the Father incarnated? That is the debate premise for this debate. And so hopefully you guys are looking forward to it. It'll be a oneness versus Trinitarian debate. And so hope you guys are looking forward to debate and it should be a fun one and lastly uh we are having a conference well i'm going to be a part of a conference in february of 2025 it's going to be an open air theology conference um and this is going to be an exciting one man. i hope you guys are looking forward to it hope you guys are able to go to the last conference i wasn't able to go wasn't able to go um uh, but this time i'll be there i'll be there as a speaker so hopefully you guys will be able to come and i'll be able to meet a lot of you guys uh i know jeremiah will be there he'll be there in the capacity as a debater so hopefully he'll be getting that debate partner soon come on jeremiah come on come on you got to get it but nonetheless this should be a fun fun conference hope you guys are looking forward to it man uh if you guys are interested in knowing more about that look, uh check out open air theology on a YouTube channel and I'm sure they have all the information there that you need for that all right that said we are excited for this debate and I am excited as well Trey Fisher and Jeremiah has been on before in the capacity of debate Jeremiah came on on a one-on-one -on -one, and uh, Trey has been on in a one-on-one -on -one debate and so now Andrew and uh, Andrew and why am I forgetting folks' name, man? Uh, Andrew and Zachary, my goodness, man, again, brain freeze here. Andrew and Zachary reached out to me and they said, hey, we're down to debate. We want a two-on-two. -two. I said, oh, okay. I think I got those some folks who will handle that, who will take care of that. And so we set it up, and now these guys are on the show, and I am glad to have them. Let me bring them in so they can introduce themselves to you guys. What's up, fellas? How y'all doing? What's up? What about it? What about it? What about it? All right, all right. I'm yeah, glad right. you guys have joined me. Appreciate you guys for coming on. So we're going to have a fun time with this topic. We are a little bit behind schedule, so I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to allow you guys to introduce yourselves to the audience so you can tell them what you do, blogs, YouTube channel, whatever you do, let them know what you do. Start with Jeremiah and Trey. Go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself, guys. Go ahead, dog. Go for it, Trey. Okay. Well, I Go just want to thank uh, Marlon. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, I've lost count how many debates this is for me on your platform, uh, but thank you. Uh, I just want to encourage everybody uh, to go over to the Apologetic Dog YouTube channel. Uh, please show some support. Please like and subscribe and check out that content. Also, check out the Apologetic Dog website at www.theapologeticdog.com. I also serve as a pastor and elder at 125 church um, here in jonesboro arkansas northeast arkansas we'd love to for you to come by and check us out and i just want to thank you so much for all the support those uh individuals that have supported the ministry that rename uh, remain nameless and i um, just want to especially thank my my wife who is the babe of all babes and um, all of my church support from 12.5 and the fishbone what about it so i'm trey <laughs> fisher um uh, I have a podcast called the Parish Reform Podcast, and we got another one coming out called What About It. It's going to be pretty awesome. Uh, but yeah, check out those. I 
came uh, my past. I had 18 years in the Church of Christ, although every time I talk to someone in the Church of Christ, they say I never was in the Church of Christ and never understood the Church of you Christ. Don't know. I went to a Church of Christ high school, met my wife at Harding, and she is the babe of all babes. Um, so, yeah, I'm a pastor at the parish, uh, the parish of the Redeemer in Calhoun, Louisiana. I love the people in the Church of Christ, and I want them to come out of it and see the gospel of Jesus Christ and to take that yoke of heavy works off their shoulders and to trust in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. That's mm. where my passion is. So glad to be here. Thanks, Marlon. All right. Thank you, guys. All right, Zach and Andrew, you guys are up next. Man, go ahead with a quick introduction to yourself. Hey, my name is Zachary Feinberg. I am a, a dad, a husband, just a normal Christian. I do preach uh, sometimes at my church, the Springs Church of Christ in South Florida and Margate specifically. I also lead evangelism where we go out there at least once a month and we just talk to people at the mall, knock on doors, whatever. If you want to have a conversation, that's what we do. I also have a YouTube channel called Let's Talk Apologetics, where it's pretty much just that it. I any type of po apologetics we want to talk about, you can, you know, send me an email, comment on anything, and that's just what I do. I really love it, and I uh, really appreciate this time to uh, come on the podcast or on the YouTube and have this awesome discussion. My name is Andrew Curl. Uh, again, thank you all for having me on. I've been preaching in Churches of Christ for, let's say, the last eight years now. Thankful to be here. I got a friend of mine who's in the process of building me a website. I'm hoping it will be done by the end of the year. I guess I'll probably try to hook up with Zach or something and uh, maybe see if he can try to help get the word out. But uh, it should be about scripture.com, I believe. And so hopefully that will be done by the end of the year. Some articles and things that I enjoy writing, different Bible topics. You can go there and read those. Hopefully we'll be, be up soon. That's it. All right, all right. Thank you guys right. for once again coming on. Appreciate you. So we're going to jump to this debate. The premise of this debate is, is water baptism necessary to receive the forgiveness of all our sins, past, present, and future? Uh, Zachary and Andrew, you guys are arguing the affirmative. Jeremiah and Trey, you're arguing the negative. And we're going to start that with 20-minute opening statements, and that's going to be followed by 10-minute open, 10 minute rebuttals. And then we're going to follow that with a, a, a total of 50-minute cross-examination. Both teams will get 20 minutes each, 25 minutes, should I say, 25 minutes each to ask questions. And then we'll follow that with five-minute closing from the audience and then a 20 to 30-minute Q&A from uh, – five-minute closing from each team and then a 20 to 30-minute Q&A from the audience. Sounds good? Yes, sir. Sounds good. All right. Zachary, Andrew, are you guys presenting, uh, taking half and half, the time half and half, or are you is someone presenting the uh, opening? Yeah, pretty much half and half. All right, you guys got it, and I will start your twenty-minute timer as soon as you guys you guys begin to speak. All right, tonight's debate centers on the question: Is water baptism necessary to receive forgiveness of past, present, and future sins? I emphatically affirm that it is. Baptism carries various meanings, but for tonight, we are focusing on baptism as the act of being immersed into Christ. In baptism, we are placed into Christ and have Christ put on us, as stated in Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This understanding of baptism is the foundation of tonight's discussion. The New Testament, as prophesied in the Old Testament and fulfilled through Jesus Christ in the New Testament, promises the complete forgiveness of past, present, and future sins for those who are in Christ Jesus. This covenant signifies a profound shift from the old Mosaic covenant, where atonements for sins required continual sacrifices, Hebrews 10.1. Uh, through Christ's sacrificial death and resurrection, the new covenant offers a once and for all atonement, providing a permanent solution to the humanity's sins problem, Hebrews 10, 12, uh, and 14. The book of Hebrews encapsulates this promise, for I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more, Hebrews 8, 12. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more, Hebrews 10, 17. This forgiveness is not contingent upon repeated ritual sacrifices, but in the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. My primary focus will be on examining Acts 2 and Paul's conversion. In Acts 2, we see Peter filled with the Holy Spirit in verses 1 through 4, begin to preach the gospel to the Jews in verses 14 through 36. Upon hearing the gospel presentation on the day of Pentecost, the listeners whose hearts were pierced by the message ask, what shall we do? 
Peter's inspired response is not, you do nothing. You're already saved because you've already believed. Your hearts have been pierced, so you have already been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You're already Christians. Instead, Peter responds, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, or of your sins, Acts 2.38. Repentance and baptisms are, are and baptism are actions that follow a person's heart being pierced by the gospel message. Through these steps, one receives the forgiveness of their sins. Therefore, forgiveness does not precede these actions. Baptism is essential for the process of receiving the forgiveness of sins. Even if one takes the position that repentance is the primary focus for the forgiveness of sins in Acts 2.38 rather than baptism, it is still important to note that repentance occurs after belief, as indicated in Acts 2.37, where the people's hearts were already pierced upon hearing the gospel message. However, my stance is that Acts 2.38 must be taken at face value. Baptism is also connected to the forgiveness of sins, just like repentance is. The Greek word translated as for in Acts 2.38 is the preposition ace. According to Thayer's Greek English lexicon, ace is a preposition governing the accusative case, denoting entrance into or direction and limit, which is translated as into, to, towards, for, and among. This suggests that baptism is the specific point at which one receives the promise of the forgiveness of sins. In the context, ace conveys the idea of moving into a state of forgiveness, indicating that at baptism... Uh, is directly the act of baptism is directly connected to entering into the state of having one's sins forgiven. Therefore, the passage clearly links baptism to the moment of receiving forgiveness, emphasizing its critical role in the process process of salvation. The the same concept of uh, on the Greek preposition ace is found in Matthew twenty six verse twenty eight, which states, "For this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins." Here, the Greek preposition ace is used again in for the forgiveness of sins. In this context, Jesus speaks of his blood being poured out on the cross for the purpose of forgiving sins. Jesus shed his blood so that sins could be forgiven, not because sins were already forgiven. Therefore, Acts 2.38 cannot mean repent and be baptized because your sins are already forgiven. The forgiveness is something that takes place after, hence the Greek preposition ace. Now to look at Paul's conversion. Acts chapter 22, we have the inspired apostle Paul recounting his conversion to his Jewish brethren. He begins by explaining that the Lord Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Paul acknowledges Jesus as Lord in Acts uh, 22 10 then the lord uh, uh, the lord jesus tells paul to rise and go into damascus and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do acts 22 10 in this instance paul is blinded and he's brought into damascus from acts chapter 9 which recounts the same events we know that paul was blinded for a total of three days which he neither uh, ate nor drank acts 9 9 we also see that the Lord appeared to Ananias and instructed him on what to do next. The Lord said to Ananias, Rise and go to the street called Straight at the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. Come and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Acts 9, 11, and 12. Clearly, Paul is praying at this moment. Because the word, uh, the Greek word for praying is a verb in the present tense, indicating that Paul is currently praying to the Lord. At this point in Paul's conversion story, the Lord Jesus has appeared to him. Paul has acknowledged Jesus as Lord. He is fasting from food and drink, and he is praying to the Lord Jesus. However, if we continue examining what Paul was instructed to do by Ananias, we see that Paul was still in his sins and not yet a Christian. Paul was told to wait in Damascus for further instructions. And Ananias came to him and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear his voice from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait, rise, and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name? Acts 22, 13 through 16. Ananias, inspired by the Holy Spirit, told Paul to rise and be baptized, to wash away his sins, calling on Jesus' name. This instruction highlights that despite Paul's encounter with Jesus, his acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord, his fasting, and his prayers, he still needed to have his sins forgiven. 
Ananias, being guided by the Holy Spirit, seeing that he's performing the miracle of healing and receiving visions, both of which are clear signs of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Mark 16, 17 through 18, and Acts 2, 17, would not have told Paul to wash away his sins if they were already forgiven. This shows that according to the book of Acts, one's sins are not forgiven until they are baptized into Jesus Christ for the purpose of forgiveness, Acts 2, 38. In recounting his conversion in Acts 22, Paul provides a detailed account of what transpired in Acts 9 and the instructions he received from Ananias. The inspired man Ananias, Paul, and Luke, the writer of Acts, all concur on the sequences of events. Even after seeing Jesus and acknowledging him as Lord and after fasting and praying for three days, Paul remained in his sins. This is why Ananias urged him not to delay but to be baptized to wash away his sins. If one wants to claim that wa the washing away of sins occurs not through water baptism, but through something that happens before baptism, such as calling on the name of the Lord, meaning acknowledging Jesus as Lord and praying to him, then several important questions arise. Why would Ananias, who is inspired by the Holy Spirit, tell Paul that he still needed to wash away? his sins away by calling on his name. Furthermore, why would Paul, when recounting the events in Acts 9, reaffirm that Ananias instructed him to wash away his sins by calling on his name? And why would Luke, the author of the book of Acts, retell Paul's conversion in a manner that stresses Ananias' uh, insistence that Paul needed to wash away his sins by calling on the Lord's name? All three inspired men, Ananias, Paul and Luke consistently affirmed that Paul was still in his sins until he followed Ananias' instructions in Acts 22, 16, to wash them away by calling on the name of the Lord. This suggests that Paul remained in his sins prior to that, uh, that moment. Now to delve into the phrase calling on his name. This expression goes beyond merely vocalizing words to Jesus. It signifies appealing to God with faith in his authority and saving power. In the New Testament, calling on his name is intrinsically linked to receiving salvation through the forgiveness of sins. As stated in Acts 2 verse 21, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Similarly, Paul, said, uh, Paul affirms in Romans 10.13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. A quick note on the phrase, shall be saved. The, in these passages, the Greek word is a verb in the future indicative passive. This verb form indicates that the action of being saved will be performed on the subject in the future. Thus, salvation results from calling on the name of the Lord. However, Ananias indicated that Paul had not yet called on his name, as Paul still needed to wash away his sins. This implies that Paul's sins had not yet been forgiven. The reason for this is that Paul had not yet been baptized, which is essential for the washing away of sins. Therefore, according to the scriptural narrative, baptism is integral to calling on the name of the Lord for salvation. Paul's conversion involves several critical steps. He, he heard directly from Jesus. He believed in him as evidenced by his prayers to him. He confessed Jesus as Lord, expressed in his repentance through fasting, and ultimately was baptized to wash away his sins, calling on his names calling on his name. These steps clearly delineate the process by which a sinner transitions into a forgiven, saved Christian. Now to give it up to my brother, Andrew. Uh, I think we lost Andrew. There we go. Hey, can y'all hear me? Yeah, we got you. Sorry, my, my internet went out. Oh. I'm assuming Zach finished this stuff. Yeah, right, go ahead, me, uh, I think you broke up like right at the 10 minute mark. We couldn't connect to you. So I'm going to start the time at 10 minutes. So uh, you'll okay. have a full t for that, that, that a lot of time. So you'll okay. you treat it. Good. All right. So you got a man for 10 minutes. All right. Thank you. I'll be reading from Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 10 and also Acts chapter 11. Obviously, I'm not going to have enough time in 10 minutes to, to read everything in those chapters. So I'll read some of it for us. Acts 10, verse 1. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household. And he gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God 
who had just come in, said to him, Cornelius. And fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. After he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. For those of us who are familiar with Acts 10, you know, the story continues. Peter sees the vision with the sheep coming down with the animals. He's told to rise, kill, and eat because Peter needed to understand that God was accepting of the Gentiles. The Jews needed to understand that this early on in the days of the Christianity. But if you look at the next chapter, Acts 11, verse 1 says, Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence. So here in Acts 11, Peter's going to recount the events of what has just happened in Acts 10. We skip, skip ahead to verse 12. Acts 11, 12 says, The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. These six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who's also called Peter, brought here. And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved. This is the Greek word sozo, and it is in the future tense here. So Cornelius needed to hear words by which he would in the future be saved. So he was not saved before Peter had arrived. And this idea of needing words to be saved, I believe everyone here who's a part of this debate is in agreement that merely hearing words is not enough to save a person. If just hearing the words saves people, then everyone that Peter and the apostles preached to on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 would have been saved. But as far as I know, there's no universalist on here. No one here believes that everyone that heard the gospel in Acts chapter 2 were immediately saved just because they heard the words. There were approximately 3,000 souls who were saved that day or added to the church that day. And so I'm suggesting that it takes both the hearing of the words and complying, the hearing of the words and obeying those words, whatever those words may be. And this idea of the importance of the words to be saved can be traced throughout Acts 10 and 11. But if you go back to Acts 10, verse 22, they said Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear words from you. Also, verse 33. So I sent for you immediately, and you've been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord. Again, they needed to hear, but they also needed to comply with what it is that they were hearing. Starting in verse 34 through verse 43, we don't have time to read all of it, but Peter is going to talk about Jesus, about his death, burial, resurrection, and how people who believe in his name will have the forgiveness of their sins. That's verse 43. But then in verse 44, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the words. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. When you compare Acts 10.44 with Acts 11.15, when Peter is recounting the events that have taken place, notice Acts 11.15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. Here, Peter's taking the audience, the Jews' mind back to what happened years earlier on the day of Pentecost, when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in tongues. And so when he says, as I began to speak, this language of, and the, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, is identical in the Greek with Acts 10.44, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all, fell upon them. The Greek here is epipipto or epipipto, fall on, come upon. It's in the aorist active indicative, third person singular for both. It, it is identical. And so when we compare these, we see that everything that Peter has been saying in Acts 10, 34 through 43, falls under the category of as I began to speak. Peter is not finished speaking yet. He's going to have more words to say. 
that Cornelius needs to hear to be saved. In verse 46, it says, for they were hearing them, Acts 10, 46, for they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered. So here Peter's going to finish the words that he was sent there to tell Cornelius. Peter answers, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So very clearly we see part of those words that Cornelius needed, needed to hear was baptism connected with water, Acts 10, 47, which is in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's so that he would be in the future saved, Acts eleven fourteen again, so is on the future tense for his salvation. Anytime these Greek words, there's different Greek prepositions that are connected with baptism to, with, with Jesus. Sometimes it's baptized. It's in epi, ace, uh, whether it's baptized on the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, into the name of Jesus. Any of those, it's water baptism. Or if you don't take that position or if you don't agree with that, which we can talk about that in the cross-examination section. But it, if you don't agree with that, you at least know that in this passage and some other ones that we'll, we can look at in the book of Acts later on if you want, we can see that it's, it's clearly not Holy Spirit baptism because Cornelius and his household had already been baptized in the Spirit. The Spirit's already been poured out on them. So this baptism here cannot be Holy Spirit baptism. It specifically says water, and logically speaking, it obviously it can't be uh, Holy Spirit baptism because they already had the Holy Spirit. I'll go ahead and concede my, the rest of my time here. All right, uh, Zach, you want to finish it off, or are you also conceding the time as well? No, we're pretty good, thank you. All right, all right. All right, next up is Jeremiah Nortier and Trey Fisher for their 10-minute opening statement. So once again, I will start your time. As soon, who's going to be presenting, Jeremiah or Trey? I'll go, I'm going to wing it. All right, Trey, you got it for 10 minutes, uh, sorry, 20 minutes, and... Oh yeah, I forgot to let you well, guys I mean, know. Little, this little chime is a one minute chime. Let you know, start wrapping it up. You got one minute left. But um, yeah, I'll start your time when you begin to speak, Trey. All right, Marlon, we're going. Uh, I'm speaking now. Here we go. Start it up. So All right, uh, you got it. yeah, we're going to split it up. I'm just going to wing this. I'm sure Jeremiah's been in a dungeon preparing his. I just got done playing golf. Got whooped too. But um, here's the deal. I just want to go right now to the rebuttal, honestly, with what was just said. It it breaks my heart for the Church of Christ. It really does. Um, I know why they believe what they believe. I know why they're taught it. I know, you know what I'm saying? I, I was there. And it's just so sad to hear things like you must do this and like to hear the phrase you must comply. I know where you're going to see in, in God telling people you must comply. He's going to say you must repent and believe. That's what you must do. And so to to read Scripture in such a, a way like you have to do this this and this and you're reading it with this no heart behind it. it's just do these things you know and it's just such a sad thing and but i understand why they believe it if that's what you've been taught your whole life if this is the the good news that you've heard because you hadn't heard and truly understood the the true good news i guess it's the best news you've ever heard at that point because at least you got a chance right but then it's just the weight of this pressure of working and working and doing and doing and trying to prove yourself but you have to say well i'm not trying to prove myself but deep down all the people in the church of Christ know it, and they're fearful if they die. Are they good enough? Have they done enough? And it's because they don't understand the true gospel because it's all based on their works and their efforts. And so it's it's just really sad for me. I mean, my heart goes out to the church of Christ people who are sitting there. Um, my beef is more with the, the, the preachers who actually read the text and study it and just keep refusing to see the truth of God's word for what it is and, and to see definitions like faith. Faith does not mean baptism. Faith means to trust in someone or something, mm -hmm. right? And so when you change the definitions of words like that, you're manipulating people, you're spiritually abusing them. And I was one of them. My wife was one of them. I have a lot of friends and family who are one of them. And it's just so sad. And uh, But I am so thankful that I get to have a technology like this to, to preach the gospel. And there's been so much fruit and, and good, awesome things for God, bringing people out of the Church of Christ. But listen, everybody has always been saved, and this is a shocker to people in the Church of Christ, but everybody has always been saved by faith alone and Christ alone. It's all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, all the way through Revelation. And so this is the way everybody is saved, 
by grace alone, through faith alone. Your works will not do it. Your obedience will not do it. You have no bragging rights when it comes to God Almighty. He was holy and perfect. We are not. We are sinners. We are rebels, but we are saved by grace. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to give the dog the rest of the time, and I can't wait for the rebuttals. Thanks, brother. <clears throat> I want to remind everybody of the debate proposition in terms of a question. Is water baptism necessary to receive the forgiveness of all our sins, past, present, and future? I want to remind everybody there are two debate topics going on tonight. What is the nature and purpose of baptism, and what is the extent of the atonement? Well, let me start with the latter and tell you that it's impossible for our interlocutors to be consistent with your future sins being forgiven in the moment of baptism if they believe you can lose your salvation, if you can walk away from the faith, or you can fall from grace. If they believe in apostasy of any kind from somebody who is truly regenerate and has their sins washed away, that is a contradiction. They, they've lost that debate. If they believe you can truly be in the covenant, um, a Christian, receive the Holy Spirit, and then you can walk away, well, what happened to your future sins that were supposedly washed away in the waters of baptism? That doesn't make sense. But I do want to let people know, I believe they're trying to borrow from our position that says you can actually trust an amazing Savior who saves to the uttermost and actually promises that you can have all your sins forgiven. But it's by resting in his finished work and not your own. So I just want people to understand it is illogical to believe that any future sins can be washed away if you can then lose your salvation. That is why Church of Christ history, going all the way back to Alexander Campbell, the, the vast majority say, no, it's your past sins that are that are remitted and washed away when you contact the blood in water. So I'm just saying if they are Church of Christ and you're tuning in your Church of Christ, they are probably not your advocates. So that is debate number uh, one, that the extent of the atonement does not make sense in their system. So I want to get back to what is the nature and purpose of baptism. Now, I appreciate our two interlocutors. Um, a lot of great verses were brought up. Perhaps we can get into it more into the rebuttal round, but they didn't. They did not define justification and sanctification. So I just want to lay these two terms out briefly because this is the paradigm that we are going to be operating under. Uh, like Trey said, salvation, our justification before God has always been by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Justification is judicial. It's the moment in time where you have your sins, the penalty of your sins, completely paid for and covered. And the book of Romans is very clear that says, hey, that happens at faith. Okay, now this isn't something new in the New Testament. Um, Romans chapter 4 quotes Genesis 15, 6 and says, Christian, the way that you are justified before God by faith apart from your, your works is the same way that Abraham was justified before God. He believed God, put his faith alone in God's promise of sending a coming Savior. And upon that basis, he was justified, counted righteous, legodzimai, and the penalty of his, his sin totally covered in full. And so justification is by pistis. This means your firm trust, not your efforts, not the things that you do, but by your faith. And so Romans 5 verse 1 says, therefore, since we have been justified by not baptism, but pistis, firm trust, not just a mental assent, not just saying the right words, but a transformed heart. Upon that basis, you can have peace with God. You can have true shalom. No more a ceasefire where you have enmity with the creator. No, you are reconciled. That verse goes on to say, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so justification, this is judicial before God, and that is by faith, Paul says, not by your works. And so sanctification is being set apart for special use. Sanctification is being conformed more like Christ and less like the world. And that means we are to obey all that Christ has commanded us in our good works and our sanctification to vindicate the truth to the watching world. So I want our audience to understand justification well, that's by faith apart from works. You don't add works to that or you compromise the gospel of grace. But that moment when you are justified by faith, then that brings you to live a wonderful life in sanctification until we die. And then we will enter into glory and then we'll be saved from the presence of sin altogether. 
Okay, so those are two terms our interlocutors did not define justification and sanctification. And so I want to go back. Uh, I want to read a simple verse that I want in the rebuttal time. I want to hear our interlocutors address. So the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter four, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Can you please define for us what faith means and what works mean? If you're going to say, well, this is a particular kind of work, you have to demonstrate that out in the text. Tell me why you think this might be the works of Mosaic law when this whole context is tethered to Abraham that precedes the work of the Mosaic law. And like my, my brother Trey said, uh, we have always been justified by the principle of faith and not by the principle of works. And so if we're not justified by the principle of works, then the Jew understands my obedience to a list of the Mosaic law, which is holy, righteous, and good, can never be the fundamental basis that washes away my sin. And so I use the word washing. Okay, now I want to switch gears and I want to talk a little bit about Acts chapter 2. And so the major proof text here, Acts 2.38. Peter is saying to a group of Jews who were pricked to the heart, they heard the gospel of grace, and he said, repent and be baptized. I just want to pause there. This is a Jewish audience. And so when he says, be baptized, baptizo, that's really, really important. We are going to define terms, uh, the fishbone and I, and we're going to contend for context. Baptizo means a ceremonial rite immersed into water that signifies a relationship with God. So every single time our interlocutor just says, it says be baptized, be baptized. I'm going to say, what did Peter mean to a Jewish audience? The apostle Paul, who was a Hebrew of Hebrews, what did he mean when he used the word baptizo? Well, it signifies a relationship with God. It signifies the forgiveness of sins. And so being immersed into water isn't new in Acts 2.38. Uh, the nearest antecedent with baptizo is with the John the Baptist. He is also, he under he has great theology. He understands that Jesus Christ is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world who takes away our sin. So he's constantly pointing to him, and he also would have been familiar with the Hebrew scriptures. What I want you to understand is being immersed into water, fully bathed, this originates in the Torah. And so hopefully we get into this context a little bit, but in the Old Testament, um, when high priests would, would be fully bathed in water, showing that they are now ceremonially clean and perform other sacrifices like sacrificing um, a goat uh, in blood as a guilt offering or sending a goat into the wilderness. Listen, these ceremonies never forgave sin. And so in Acts 2, the Jews, when, when Peter says repent and be baptized in the authority of Christ, essentially, they would understand Oh man, this participation in a ceremony signifies that I am submitting to Jesus as king and he is the one that contains forgiveness of sins. And so we see two imperatives, repent and be baptized. Repent, the author Luke in his gospel and in the book of Acts, repent is always, always, always tethered with forgiveness of sins. And this is not just a mere intellectual assent, but this is a repentance. Always the backside is faith. And so as we read that passage in Romans, it's faith, a repentant faith apart from your works that justifies you before God. And if that is true, then that leads to outward change. And so when we look at repent and coordinating conjunction for you people out there, repent and be baptized, this is a command to be justified by repentant faith. This is also a command to be sanctified if it's true that you have repented truly from the heart, a heart of faith that now believes and trusts in Jesus will demonstrate that faith. And so uh, I want to put Acts 2 on pause and just show you kind of the strong consistency in Acts chapter 3. As I've heard the fishbone say before, well, Peter's not going to contradict his first sermon in his second sermon. And so when you look at uh, verse 15 of chapter 3, we're talking about how the author of life, King Jesus, you are to have faith in his name. And he tells his audience, repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. That is so painfully clear right there. Right, Fishbone? That repentance yeah, can I jump in is a little what bit? is connected. Yeah, go for it. I want to jump in some. I didn't know we could talk about what they talked about. 
But when we're talking about, you know, I thought that was the rebuttal time. I'm not a professional debater like you. But when we're talking about Acts 238 <laughs> for the forgiveness of sins, right? Well, when were the forgiveness of sins? When did people's sins, when were they forgiven? When? I, I believe Christianity teaches it was at the cross of Jesus Christ. So when you read in Luke chapter 3 or Matthew chapter 3, uh, but Luke 3, 3, I think it's uh, where it says John baptized for, the, for, uh, for repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Was the people's sins forgiven when they came out of the water of the Jordan River? No, they were mm. forgiven, truly forgiven at the cross. When was Abraham's sins truly forgiven? It wasn't the, from the blood of bulls and goats. It was at the cross of Jesus Christ. So it was saying for the forgiveness of sins. So unto the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't always mean in something in the future, right? Because they, Acts 2.38 is looking back to the cross. Abraham and John the Baptist and everybody else is looking forward mm. to the cross. So it's unto the forgiveness of sins. That's another way. And that word for ace is used many times as unto a witness to something. So, you know, it's just the same arguments they have. Um, I cannot wait to go into Acts 22. I'm going to save that one for the rebuttal of Paul's conversion <laughs> um, because I don't, you know, six minutes is not enough. But, but like what Jeremiah was saying in the Old Testament, I think we all can agree, even the people in the Church of Christ, the Church of Christ doctrine, the people in the Church of Christ would say that circumcision was a sign that you were in the covenant community of God's people. We, it's very clear in Romans that circumcision was of the heart, right? Well, that goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, that God tells them to circumcise your heart. But guess what? You can't do that. So what was the sign of circumcision of the flesh? It was a sign pointing to the true reality. Now, some people became really legalistic in the Jewish religion, okay? In Judaism, they became the Pharisees, the very legalistic people who thought the actual act of cutting off the flesh of this circumcision actually did something for them. No. But the true believers of God, the remnant of Israel all through the Old Testament, they always knew that that was just a sign pointing to a true reality of a circumcision of the heart. And every time God made a covenant with his people, he gave them a sign. He gave Noah a sign. He gave Abraham a sign. He had the Sabbath was a sign under the Mosaic covenant. I just have some feedback now coming to my ears. I'm hearing myself. Oh, no. I'm hearing me. That's weird. I'm talking to myself. But in the Mosaic covenant, <laughs> the Sabbath was a sign. And so when we get in the new covenant, guess what? There's a sign and it's baptism. And none of these, these signs pointed. I mean, they all pointed to the true spiritual reality. The sign itself doesn't do anything. That would be like when you, you're starving to death and you're driving down the interstate and you see a McDonald's sign. Do you go and hug the sign? Or do you go to what it points to, the hamburger inside the building? That's what signs do. They always point to a true reality. So I just want to say that. I'll, I'll let you jump back in here for four minutes and 50 seconds because i got to fix these ears. Fishbone, I, could, I couldn't have said it any better myself. But what, what Trey is emphasizing is your participation in a ceremony that's meant to be a sign that signifies spiritual realities cannot be the means – and grounds of your justification because that is to conflate faith and works. These two words mean different things. And as our interlocutors, you heard him earlier, you must act. You must uh, be obedient to these commands by their own admission. They are saying your expressed faith in your works. That must happen. Uh, it's not just faith at the moment of faith you're justified, but when faith has worked, a particular action mm -hmm. in baptism. If they say, well, it's not, it's not your works, Jeremiah, I'm going to say, okay, well, then it's, there, it's no longer an act of faith in baptism. If they want to say, well, baptism is the powerful working of God, I'm going to say, well, sure, it's a work of God, but is it also a work that you participate in? Because this is our heart. I want everybody to understand that the gospel of grace is not faith plus your accomplishments, your obedience to a five-step formula, and getting immersed all the way into water. Trey, I've had so many conversations with people say, if your hand didn't make it all the way in the water, then you disobeyed. Let me, let me get this very clear. If you are not trusting alone, in Christ alone, apart from all of your works, then you have disobeyed the gospel. And so like Trey said, let's save Acts 22.16. Um, and let's talk about what it means to truly call upon the name of the Lord. A verse that was brought up oh, yeah. was Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you were baptized into Christ. So my, my question is, how did Paul, with a Jewish background, how did he understand the word baptizo? They will have to categorically reject 
the definition that says that baptism is a ceremonial rite immersed into water that signifies. If I hold up a picture of my beautiful family, Trey, and I say, this is my family, you're not going to say, well, that's literally Jeremiah's family. That is crazy talk. That is a sign. That is a picture. And when you think that when you're getting into the water, that that literally washes away your sin, then you are confusing the picture uh, with the what it signifies. You are confusing the representation for the reality, and you have conflated faith and works and law with gospel. And so Galatians 3, 27 has a context. What is the verse that comes right before? For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through not faith, Trey, or uh, not baptism, but by faith. And like you always point out, for as many of you that are sons and daughters, you wear your baptism as clothes. So can you put something on if you don't exist? Right. So these are already sons and daughters of the most high by faith. And so what I want you to listen and you'll see how we provide pushback in the rebuttal time and the cross. exit. They're going to say, well, Jeremiah, Acts 238 doesn't say um, what must we do? And Peter say you do nothing. Well, they're misunderstanding our position. We're, we're saying you don't do anything in your works. How do you respond to the gospel of grace? Well, you respond in faith that understands that you cannot add any of your accomplishments to Jesus's already finished work. And so as we begin to wind down here, um, it was a very interesting, Trey. They appealed to Cornelius, and this only goes against their case. Uh, yes, the Holy Spirit was at work while Peter began to speak. Guess what? The Holy Spirit was going out with uh, conviction. He was regenerating the hearts of those that are hearing the sweet gospel of grace. And here's the whole point. You cannot have unregenerate unbelievers experiencing the Holy Spirit and able to extol God. All of these happened before they entered into the watery graves of baptism. So I just want to leave it there and tell you all, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, this truly is an honor, and I look forward to defining terms and context is always king. Hey, Trey, Trey I can't hear you. Man. I think you're muted, Trey. Marlon, I, these 20 seconds, oh, why am I getting feedback back in my ears of me talking? What I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea. Know. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I, I'm not. I'm not even sure what's going on there. I have no idea, man. But um, he might can fix it while we hear the rebuttals. Yes, yes. All right. So Zachary and Andrew, you guys are up next for your 10 minute rebuttals. And as before, remember this little chime. That is your one minute warning that you need to start wrapping up your rebuttals. And that said, I'll start your 10 minute timer as soon as you begin to speak. All right. Well, thank you for that opening statement. I really appreciate that. But to dive in, um, I want to get to the point where Trey had mentioned about the word repent. He says that I agree we must repent. So I'm wondering, what do you mean by that you must repent? Does that mean that there's something being done like an action or is it something that just God is giving you in regeneration? So I'd like to understand that a little bit more. Um, and then also, uh, do you agree that? Uh, so I'll, um, sorry. Um, and does faith mean something that you do? You know, you said, does faith mean it, you, it means something that you do, like trusting in someone? Again, is it you actually trusting in somebody? Like, for example, if I were to go to my son and say, hey, son, I'm going to pick you up from school at three o'clock or whatever time, and he believes and trusts in that, again, that's him actively hearing those words, him believing and following through with him believing in it. So again, that's something that he's doing. Um, and then again, getting to the point, or this is a two-part debate, the reason that uh, we formulated it this way is because in Christ is all justification. It is the complete forgiveness of sin. Like I said in my opening statement, it's the Old Testament had the continual animal sacrifices, whereas in the New Testament, in the New Covenant prophesied from the Old Testament, it's once and for all those who are in Christ Jesus. They're completely forgiven. So if we want to get into a debate in regards to can you fall away, I would love to have a debate on that topic, but that debate is not for today. It's about water baptism being the point in which you're forgiven. So if you want to ask me questions during your cross-examination about that, we can get into that, but or we can have that for another debate. 
But again, I believe that the reason that we say that it is the complete forgiveness is because that was what was promised in the in the Old Testament, that in Jesus Christ, we would have the complete forgiveness, Jesus being the high priest to ever live um, to for, for the his blood to cover us forever. Um, and I... Uh, And also, I agree that, you know, when you look at Romans chapter 5 and it talks about that we have peace with God, you know, that we've been justified through faith. I, I agree with faith. I agree with that. But you have to define what you mean by faith. Faith doesn't necessarily mean just trust because it's actually the word pistuo. Even in Romans chapter 5, it's something being done. It's a verb in the active. You know, I would like for you to show me somewhere in the gospel of John, somewhere where you actually show me a word that says faith, pistuo, pistuo pistis, however you want to say it, where it's something that's being done to you. Because again, like for the Calvinist position, it's God is giving you the faith. You know, it's not you having faith, it's God giving it to you. Something that would be in the passive, but in actuality, you know, it's something that you're doing. Right. And then again, getting to Romans chapter four, um, I'll let uh, Andrew deal with that one. Um, and then again, going to Acts chapter two, the reason I wouldn't disconnect baptism with repentance is because they're linked together for the forgiveness of sins. This is something that takes place after their hearts were already pierced. The text is clear. Yes, it's it's a Jewish context, but the gospels for the Jew and the Gentile, it's both one and the same. It's when you believe, then what happens is you're going to follow through with that and you're going to call upon the name of the Lord and you're going to actually uh, repent and be baptized. Just like Trey said, that it's something that you must do. It's something that has to be done. Repentance is something must be done. And if you look at the Greek there in Acts chapter 2, it's a, it's, it's a verb that's actually something that you're doing. He's telling them to do something. So again, it's repentance um, and being baptized is the same uh, language there. Um And yeah, like I was saying, like baptism is a is is not a work in the sense of that we're doing something. Baptism is actually something that's being done to us. So if you say that, yeah, you know, it's a part of the first thing of sanctification because you get up and walk to the baptistry, you have a thought that I'm gonna actually go get baptized, but that's not what's happening. Baptism is something being done to you. It is the moment in which you're being placed into Christ in the spirit. It's not something literally happening. It's something that is in the spiritual realm taking place in that very moment. Um, and then Jeremiah says, um, and also I want to look at the idea of in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where it says, repent for the forgiveness of sins. And he wanted to say that repentance is always tethered with forgiveness of sins. That's what Jeremiah said. That if you look at Luke, that's what it's being connected with. But then Trey came around and said, actually, it's it should be read as like because or something that ha already happened. So what is it? Is repentance for the forgiveness of sins or is repentance because your sins were already forgiven? All right. Uh, now over to Brother Andrew. Okay, <clears throat> the comment was made that from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through the book of Revelation, it is salvation by grace alone through faith alone. Not a single verse was provided because there's not one. So if they want to try to show one, we'd be happy to, to look at that. <clears throat> also, it was said that people who have been, received the Holy Spirit, they're not able to fall away. They can't fall away. In Acts 19, verse 6, the Apostle Paul gives the Holy Spirit to the new converts at Ephesus. They get baptized in, in the name of Jesus Christ in Acts 19, 5. And then the Apostle Paul gives them the Holy Spirit in Acts 19, 6. The book of Ephesians, Ephesians 1, verses 12 through 14, speaks of how they had, uh, had the, how they had the Holy Spirit. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit for the, uh, for the day of redemption. And yet in Re Revelation chapter 2, we see that the angel of the church in Ephesus write, and if you look at Revelation 2, verse 2, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. You have perseverance, you've endured for my namesake, and have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at the first, or else I'm coming to you and remove your lampstand out of its place. The lampstand, of course, is a symbol in the book of Revelation for the church itself. And so Jesus threatening to remove them from being his church if they do not repent 
And this can't be talking about people who were never saved to begin with, because he says, repent and do the deeds you did at the first. So it's clearly talking about people who were in a safe condition, and yet they were in jeopardy of not being in a safe condition. If Jesus is going to remove their status of being a church. Also, don't have time to go look at it, but Hebrews chapter 6 also clearly shows that people who had received the Holy Spirit were able to fall away, and many of them did in the first century, just like Jesus prophesied what happened in Matthew 24, verses 11 through 14. Um, also, we've got justified by faith. I, I, I agree. Zach and I don't have a problem with the idea of people being justified by faith. We're also justified in baptism because Romans 6, verse 7, uses the same uh, Greek word for justification, dikaio. It says the one who has died is set free, justified from sin. But in the context of Romans 6, it's not talking about our physical deaths. It's talking about what happens when one is baptized. Romans 6, verse 3, you're baptized into Christ's death. You are buried with him through baptism into death. And so if you want to call it a ceremony or whatever you want to call it, Romans 6 is clearly not about sanctification. It is still talking about justification because it uses the same Greek word for justify in Romans 6 and verse 7. Also, the comment was made, Romans chapter 4. Well, I'd love to see in the context. What, why is it in Romans 4 verse 3? This, this is talking about the works of the law of Moses. Okay, we'll give you the context. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 speaks of how a person cannot be justified by the works. Uh, a, person just, a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Of the law. Also, verse 28, no flesh is justified by the works of the law. And then after the verse in question, after Romans 4, verse 3, you read about Abraham was justified in the, in the eyes of God before circumcision, not after circumcision, before circumcision. So clearly in the immediate context, the verses before Romans 4, 3 and the verses after Romans 4, 3 clearly are showing you that the context is talking about the law of Moses. Abraham was able to be justified in the eyes of God prior to uh, the Mosaic Law, which was the whole major thing that was running through the, the book of Romans. That's why Romans 8 talks about uh, those in the flesh cannot please God. Those in Judaism, those who are keeping the Old Covenant, they cannot please God. And they didn't because Jesus' death had already made the atonement. Therefore, they needed to come out of that Old Covenant, come into the New during that 40-year period. Well, I say during that 40-year period from 30 to 70, but even today, if people want to claim they're going by the Old Law today, they should still uh, come out of that uh, as well. Um, that's good. I can see my time there. All right, Zachary, you good as well? Yeah, I'm good. All right, all right. All right, guys, so we are done with the openings and the rebuttals, so now we're going to transition to the favorite part of every debate, which is the cross-examination. Yes. Marlon, you forgot, you we forgot didn't get about rebuttal. our rebuttal time. Oh, why? See, I, you know what that's it's all about, guys. I, I, I am just so excited to get the cross X going, and that's all that was. <laughs> that is, that's all that. Oh. <laughs> Marlon, oh, I'm sorry, can y'all hear me? Yeah, yep. you, you, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, all good. of that was all excitement. Right, I'll start a that, that's, that's all it was. But all right, you guys got ten minutes, man. Uh, I'll start your time as soon as you begin to speak. I'm gonna make it quick here. Do you have to repent? No. Just like you would tell people, you don't have to do anything. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. Nothing. Repentance is, guess what that is? When I repent of my sins, that's a sign, evidence of a changed heart that God's already changed my heart. Remember, all the way back to Deuteronomy, circumcise your heart, but you can't do that. It's the work of the Spirit of God. The flesh is no help at all. And so do you repent? No. Like, you don't repent to be saved. You repent because you are saved. What is faith, you ask? Faith is a gift from God. That's what it is. So faith is not something you conjure up. Faith is not something that you do when you tell your son, hey, just believe me, I'll be back from the store in a minute. What does your son do? He does nothing. He sits there and waits because he believes. Kind of like us, we abide in Christ. We wait and we trust in him and him alone. So uh, really quick, let's see here. Uh, uh, baptism, let's see. Yeah, when you said that baptism is not something that we're doing, then why tell people that they got to do it? If, if it's something that you don't do, baptism is not something don't that mean you that. do. It's not something we do. It don't mean that. Then why tell people to do it? Uh, you said that nowhere in the Bible does it preach that people were saved by faith alone. Romans 4, Abraham. Uh, justified by faith. You said, yes, I, we agree that you're justified by faith. And then you said, and when you're baptized. 
So are you justified when you have faith? Like Romans 5, 1 says that you're justified by faith. Now you have peace with God. The question is, do you have true peace with God when you have faith? Or are you not at peace with God when you have faith? But how can you be justified when you have faith and justified when you're baptized? It's because the Church of Christ changes the definition of the word faith. And they try to make it include baptism. So here we go. You're about to have it, Jeremiah, but I'm going to I'm going to knock out this Paul's conversion deal Take time. because I would say that the Church of Christ would say that the Bible does not contradict. Correct. The Bible does not contradict. OK, now, if we look at Paul's conversion, you made a big you stress the, the deal. Why would Luke stress his baptism? My question is when Paul's giving his testimony, not just a recording of Luke of what happened, but when Paul's giving his actual testimony in Acts 26 and in Galatians 1, why doesn't he stress his baptism? He doesn't even mention it. I mean, to be the crescendo of his salvation, I would think he would have mentioned it. But when we go into this, like you said, in your statement, Zachary, I believe it was, uh, yeah, no, who did the uh, Paul one on their first statement? But here's the thing. You said, let me find my notes here. I wrote it down. Right. Yeah, Zach, you were the one. You said, if you look closely at Paul's conversion, he did believe, and then he confessed, and he called upon his name, but his sins were not washed away until he was baptized. I totally disagree, and I don't think that's good Bible reading, so I'm going to point some things out. We would agree, like you just said, he did believe, he heard from the Lord Jesus Christ, he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, he confessed the Lord Jesus Christ, and like you even said, he confessed him, right? He confessed him, he called on the name of the Lord. I'm glad we agree with that. But I would say his sins were forgiven before he was baptized, unless you want to go to bed tonight, admitting that the Bible contradicts. You're probably not going to say it, but you're probably not going to be able to sleep well after this. John 9, 31, it says, We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. So God was not just listening to the prayer of Paul. He was actually answering his prayer. He was saying, I'm going to send in an Ananias, and he is going to give your sight back. So, how does this guy in John 9 know that God does not listen to sinners? Because he's listening to Paul, and according to you, Paul is still in his sins. So why is Jesus not just listening and hearing it, but he's answering it as well? Is he must be a worshiper of God, according to 931. But why do they know that? Well, because the Old Testament teaches it. In Proverbs 15, 8, it says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. If you look at Paul's conversion, his prayer was acceptable to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ was hearing it and he was answering his prayer. Proverbs 15, right here in verse 29, says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. My question is, was Jesus hearing his prayers and answering his prayers? Yes. Does the Bible contradict here? In Psalm 66, 18 through 19, it says, If I had, a cher if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So I guess Paul did not cherish iniquity in his heart. It goes on to say in verse 19, but truly God has listened. He's attended to the voice of my prayer. See, God doesn't listen to sinners, people who hate him. He does not listen to sinners, but worshiper of God that he listens to. My question is, is Jesus listening to Paul before he's baptized? What do you do with the text? You can't do anything with it other than say, you know what? I'm wrong. Isaiah, uh, let's see here. I think I got one in Psalm. No, Isaiah 59.2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. Oh, my goodness. Isaiah 59, 2 says that your sins, because of your sins before a holy God, he does not hear you. Here's my question. Was Jesus hearing the prayers of Paul and answering them? Yes, he was. Does the Bible contradict? No, they don't. You know why? Because everyone who calls the name of the Lord, like you said, and like Paul later said in chapter 10 of Romans, he did believe, he did confess, and he did call on the name of the Lord. He was saved. And so Ananias was doing what Christians do. He was doing the, the Great Commission. That's what I'll, I'll leave it right there at that. I'll let you take up the rest of the time. Sorry for that oh, time oh, I took oh, there. Thanks, Fishbone. No. No, uh, Fishbone did an excellent job of, of showing us that the fruit of repentance, the actions that are produced from a repentant heart, those actions, those works do not forgive sin. Absolutely not. 
Uh, must a person repent? Well, repentance is metanoia. That's the changing of the mind. This is a Hebrew understanding of a volitional heart change. We can look in Luke chapter 3. There's a difference between repent and and the, the fruit in keeping with repentance. And so you got to have that distinction. A repentant faith always produces works. So must you repent? That's a heart issue. That's a heart of faith issue, not the fruit like Trey was bringing out. The question was asked, do you mean, does faith mean something you do? Faith is a gift. Faith isn't something you can conjure up. up. A, uh, a heart of faith that continues to believe, well, the just will live by faith. That inward heart of trust, that 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 trust will produce work. So these these questions, uh, when you when you understand the differences between faith and works and justification and sanctification, uh, we see the harmony. Um, I think it was Zachary may, uh, said our debate is not about falling away. Well, let me remind you of the debate title: Water baptism yes, is necessary is. For, to receive the forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future. That is, a, that is a part of our debate. You believe future sins like falling away are covered in the waters of baptism. That is the debate proposition. You're going to have to be the one to square that circle, not us. Um, it was said that I agree with Romans 5.1. Faith is, faith is not just trust. Faith is something that you are doing. Absolutely, but not in your works. Faith is an experience that you have because faith is a gracious gift from God. It's not your doing in terms of your works. Zachary, I believe, does not understand the, the Jewish significance in Acts chapter 2. I'll repeat, it's not continual ceremonies. We all agree, but what is the, the principle of ceremony itself? Well, the ceremony signifies the forgiveness of sins that are in Christ Jesus. That is the question that y'all are begging every single time you read the word baptism or baptizo. They said baptism is not an act that we do. Okay, then it's no longer an act of faith. So just to want to remind you there, it was also said by the other gentlemen, salvation is never to be said by faith alone and Christ alone. Well, actually, uh, the phrase that we keep pointing people to is it's by faith and not by works, by faith apart from works. That's what we mean by faith that. Only. Um, it was exactly that. That's a theological conclusion that we're saying Romans 5, 1. We're not redefining faith into faithfulness like Roman Catholics do, Greek Orthodox, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Church of Christ. Uh, they pointed to Revelation chapter 2 where Jesus says, I know your deeds or your works, your perseverance. You have left your first love. Repent. Absolutely. A repentant heart leads to fruit of repentance. We are justified by faith apart from works, and the just shall live by faith. I have to throw this one in there, Fishbone. I almost I was like, okay, uh, can't wait. Uh, Romans 6 is not about sanctification. Have you ever heard someone say that before to me in a debate? Let me just say Romans what, what, what? 6, 19 says, So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading. Ooh. Jeremiah, Romans 6 isn't about sanctification. Oh, but it's leading to sanctification. And it says it again, verse 22, that um, that we have become slaves to God, the fruit that leads to sanctification. And lastly, uh, Romans 6, seconds. 7. Yep, uh, the verse 7 does talk about justification, and there's a context about baptism, but you have never once defined that baptism is a ceremonial rite immersed into water that signifies, beautifully pictures these realities. Ooh. And I will also say I love Romans 6, verse 8. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. It says for uh, the one who has died in verse 7, the one who has died has been set free from sin. You were dead before you were baptized. You're saved, set free from sin, is justified before you're about to right. baptize dead people. All right. Thank you guys so much for these openings and the rebuttals. So now we're transitioning. Now we actually got got that second rebuttal out the way. So I appreciate you guys for that. So now we're going to transition to the cross examination of the debate. Once again, this will be a total of 50 minutes. Both teams will get 25 minutes each to ask questions. Uh, we know that sometimes as you are winding up with your question, you tend to sort of give an extended wind up. Let's try to minimize that wind up. Let's get right to the question. Uh, the one that's receiving the question. If you can answer the question with a simple yes or no, please do that. You do not want to bog your opponent team, your, your opponent's time down with long-winded monologues, all right? With that said, Zachary and Andrew, you guys up first for your 20-minute cross-examination of Jeremiah and Trey. And I will start your 25-minute timer as soon as you begin to ask your first question. All right, guys. 
Trey, Jeremiah, whichever one of y'all want to want to answer it, it's cool. I'm not singling either one of y'all out. Whoever feels like answering. Um, do you mind just sharing with us, in your view, when was Cornelius saved? When he believed. When he believed. When he believed what? Well, I'll just say this. Are we in uh, chapter 10 here? Yeah. I would say. I don't know what happened to him. Oh, okay, the there last, you go. The last, yeah, the last, uh, the way he ends his sermon here in verse 43, to him all the prophets bear okay. witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So I would say okay. when he so believed that point, in Christ. At that point, in verse 43, or, okay. So you also said that, correct me if I'm wrong, that John 9, is it John 9, 31? God does not listen to the prayers of sinners. He does not heed, he does not heed sinners' prayers. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. But worshipers of God listen to them. Okay. But, so it says John unregenerated, unsaved people, but unregenerated, unsaved people, he does not listen to them. Well, he hears them in the sense that he knows everything. But like in Amos, when he says to Israel, only you of all the families of the earth have I known in an intimate relationship. But he knew that all the other families of the earth existed. He hears all yes. their things. He knows what's being said. Right. He knows everything, right? But uh, not in that intimate way. Okay. So do you believe it was in an but intimate Cornelius way? But Cornelius was a worshiper when, of God. Right. But he's not saved yet in, in, in Acts 10, verse 1 and 2. He's not saved yet. Mm-hmm. Right. Fishbone, can I hop in there? Come on with it. So I, 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 personally, I personally believe that um, God worshipers, those that fear God, are regenerate. But Cornelius is saved in the unique sense that Acts 4.12 talks about the greater revelation that the, the name of the Savior is Jesus of Nazareth. And so Cornelius being unregenerate under Old Testament standards does not have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit because he has not received the full revelation of Jesus Christ. So he can be a God fear, somebody that worships God truly from the heart because he's regenerate, but he has not heard the full revelation of being saved in the, the entirety of what the New Testament says until he hears the gospel of grace that was proclaimed to him by Peter. So are you saying like, that... Um, go ahead. Go I was ahead, just going to say it would be like Lydia, a Lydia who was a worshiper of God. And so it says that the Holy Spirit forbid them to go preach over here. The Spirit of Jesus Christ forbid them to preach over here. They said, go to Macedonia is what, the, what Jesus told them. So they went to Macedonia. I didn't freeze again, did I? I mean, I hear you. Part. Yeah, I don't know what yeah. happened oh, there. Right. But go ahead. So again, like Lydia was a, a worshiper of God, and the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to the message. So when you study the Old Testament and things like this, uh, worshipers of oh, God, we would argue that they, you know, it's the elect of God. It's those who were chosen mm. by God. Okay. And so okay. Cornelius is one of those. He's not regenerated. God. Right, but he, but he wasn't saved yet until Peter got to, to him and preached to him about believing in Jesus, right? Well, I would believe he was saved. I think he was elect, the elect of God. He was a worshiper of God, like John 9, 31, right? He doesn't listen to sinners. Okay, so he's already saved. those who okay, are worshipers so of God, okay, so he listens to them. Okay, so he's so, so he's regenerated, he's in the, and he has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when he believes, like Peter said in the okay. message. And the reason God is sending, calling Cornelius and Peter to come to Cornelius is because he's a worshiper of God, and he's okay. bringing Peter to give him the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which the Old Testament okay. and what so he understood at the time pointed to. Okay. So, so that's the reason why uh, God is heeding his prayer by sending him Peter because he's already saved, he's already regenerated. Yes. I think that we've we've said that. I mean, he was the elect of God. He was a worshiper of God right, under the right. Old Testament understanding. Yes, yes, he I, had that. And yes, he believed in God. Make, and so then, yes, because it's under the new dispensation of Christ and the gospel of Christ, okay. so now he's going to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because of his right. belief in him. Okay, so, gotcha. So he's already saved. Do you think the angel was mistaken in Acts 11, where it says that the angel came to him and told him to go and tell him words by which he will be saved in the future? Was that was the angel mistaken? No, I don't think the angel was mistaken. So I'm not saying he was saved. Angel. Again, I'm saying he was saved by believing in Jesus Christ and having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I'm saying he was a worshiper of God. 
before that took place. Okay. Would you agree that the text so says that he was a worshiper of God? Hey, Would Trey, you, you yeah. can't ask questions, Trey. You, can, yeah. you can't ask well, questions, Trey. Yeah. You, 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 sorry, you can ask that when it's your cross Um uh, So you're saying that a person has to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or the gift of the Holy Spirit um, prior to conversion, correct, for regeneration? Trey, you may hop in there. I believe, yeah, let me hit this one when you hop in. I believe Christ's words when he says the spirit gives life, the flesh is no help at all. Go ahead, Jeremiah. Andrew, do you want to ask a follow-up question? But uh, Well, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if Cornelius, he was saved when he believed or when he received the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Well, you're talking about God fears, so this, this is a well, unique okay. Old Testament. Okay. Well, let, let me word it this way. I, I, I've heard you say, Jeremiah, in some, in some of your debates that, that the forgiveness of sins is basically the equivalent of the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is basically it's the equivalent of forgiveness of sins. They go together. You, do you yes, still believe especially that? In the new covenant. Yes. No, in the New oh, Covenant context, okay. that's the gift of the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit. Okay, so why why is it that in Acts 2, uh, verse 38, why are the people able to repent and be baptized before they have the forgiveness of their sins? Because Lombano's in the, in the future tense, they will receive in the future the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because that kind of sounds like our position, that re repentance and baptism can both come prior to the forgiveness of sins. No, I, I disagree. I, I see a strong continuity with repentance as always what is entailed by the forgiveness of sins at the moment of justification. You're begging the question with your understanding of baptism. Okay. Okay. Um, you, you've also been saying that uh, baptism is a work of uh, ergon that, that we do. Yes, that's something we do. It's like the first part of our sanctification. It's not for justification. Water baptism is for uh, sanctification, not justification. Correct? If you if we agree that we participate in baptism, then there's no way around that we are doing some kind of effort and action. Okay. So could you can you explain to us what what is when 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 the when baptizo the, the Greek verb when it's uh, when when the Greek speaks of things in the passive voice or the active voice can you explain for everybody what the difference is between I, I'm not a Greek scholar but I, can you explain to us real quick what what you think the difference is between the active voice and the passive voice Yeah well it's in the yeah. the, the sentence syntax so it is communicating to us things that happen in real time so it has to do with understanding the noun and the verb in the sentences. Um, and I want to say every time we talk about baptizo, it's talking about the ceremony. So are there aspects in a ceremony that we are passive? Absolutely. When we are going down into the water, are there times in the ceremony when we are active, like expressing our faith? Many people confess Jesus as Lord in their baptism. So they are participating. If they are getting up and walking to the baptistry, that's a part of the whole ceremony that is declaring the gospel of grace. Okay. Can can you just explain to us why, if if baptism is a work that we do, why is it every time a person or a group of people get baptized in the New Testament, why is it in the passive voice and not active? Because there's because there's a moment in our uh, the the ceremony of baptism where we are passive, but that's not the full range of the ceremony. We get up, we participate. Um, the Typically, the bapt baptizer like Ananias is declaring the gospel upon their confession. So you're talking about one moment in the entire ceremony. But the moment that you say you're entirely passive during baptism, that no longer is an expression or act of faith. So baptism, I'm just, just making sure I clarify, so just make sure I sure. understand. Baptism sure. is a work that we do, or it's a, work, it's a work that we do or a work that we don't do. It is both a work of God, and you're not asking about it, but it, it is a work that we do along with the baptizer who is also working in the ceremony. Even even though baptism for a person or a group of people is never active voice, it is a work that it we do. It wouldn't have to if we understand the, the process that we are going into the water and we're coming out. Uh, to, to say the, o the only time that the ceremony is a ceremony is when you're no longer doing anything is to miss the whole point of what the ceremony is signifies yeah i would also uh, disagree that every time baptizo is mentioned is a passive voice rise and be baptized and wash your sins away is not passive it's a verb and it's yes, in the it's, middle voice cor and correct means, i, I so agree the middle, yep. right the middle voice means it's the grammatical voice that signifies that the subject of the verb is being affected by its own action or is acting upon itself yes. so if we're going to take acts 22 16 we're saying that paul doing this action and this verb of bapti baptism 
also he is causing his sins to be washed away. But we know this is talking about a spiritual thing. This is not talking about a physical, his sins are floating down the river. And it's in, in a middle voice because surely we don't believe that Paul causes his own sins to be forgiven. But that's the grammatical text of Acts 22, 16. Yes, and, and Acts 22, 16 is the only one that I could find where a person or a group of people is getting baptized in its middle and not passive. And I think the reason why it's middle in Acts 22 versus in Acts 9, the original account where Saul gets baptized by, uh, by Ananias, it's, which is passive there. But in Acts 22, the reason I believe it's in the middle is because Paul in Acts 22 is retelling his own conversion story. It's not like Luke or someone narrating the story. And therefore, yes, he does have to be uh, both active and passive in the sense that obviously we would all agree that just because of, I, I would think we would all agree, that just because a person goes Andrew, swimming. Andrew, do you have a question with that? Uh, let's, let's make sure yeah. we're asking questions, Andrew. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I, did, I did have another question or two, but I don't want to uh, have Zach around at the time, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and pass it over to Zach. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Hello, boy, Andrew. All right. <laughs> Does Acts 2, verse 37, teach us that those whose hearts were pierced were already saved? You got a fishbone if you want to go first. Well, I believe there's, you know, when we read the context of this, Luke is um, interviewing people. He's writing this account, right? And there, he's, he's hearing this, and he says, look, they were cut to the heart. I mean, when you tell them a story of someone who was truly cut, man, they were like, I told them the story and they were cut to the heart. It means something affected their heart, right? So I would say that not every single person who is at Pentecost, their hearts were cut, but the people he's referring to here that goes on down who did believe in his message and were baptized and added to the church that day, he's referring to those people who were truly cut to the heart. And yeah, so again, would you say that the question just, just those people that were cut to the heart, uh, did they experience, like, did they? respond positively to the gospel message? I think those who are truly cut to the heart and have a change of heart by God, there's yeah, always those in be verse 37. Outward yes. sign. Okay, so those in verse 37, but they again, I don't think those experience. are every single person who was at Pentecost. No, no, it's I'm, I'm agreeing. Just those in verse 37, the one that said that those pure, I mean, not all the million Jews that were there, it's obviously, you know, specified the 3,000 later, but those, they were, they had the regeneration and they responded positively in verse 37, correct? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, do you believe a person who has not yet experienced the regeneration of the Holy Spirit can respond positively to the gospel message? Absolutely not. Romans 8 is very clear on that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Romans 8 okay. says the person of the flesh cannot submit to God's law. Indeed, he cannot. The person of the flesh who has the mind of the flesh cannot please mm -hmm. God. Do you think it would be pleasing to get baptized? Gotcha. Yeah, I'll, ask, I'll answer that on in your yeah. cross-examination. So the next question is, do you think that Peter also shares the exact <laughs> same perspective that you do? I don't think Peter can see the hearts of people. I think the Bible teaches that only God knows our heart. I know my heart and God knows my heart. And because Peter doesn't know his heart, he's preaching the gospel. And he says to him, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, right? And so- But Peter those who respond positively, but, but my main point is those who respond positively they would have been regenerated because a person that has not yet been generate, regenerated, you already said, would not respond positively to the gospel message. So does pa Peter right, share I don't know because, perspective? Yeah, but I don't know the hearts of people. You can say things. You can say, you know, there's people in this country today who are male and they say they're female, right? Like, but they walk around as males. Yeah, they identify not as what I'm getting I don't right, know though. what people say and what they believe. No, I mean, I'm just saying he doesn't know their mm -hmm. heart. So they were cut to the heart, but Luke's going back and retelling the story as it occurred. He's I know, but what you already now. but you already answered, but you already answered that a person that has not yet been regenerated would not respond positively to the gospel message. Correct. Well, you already a, answered not in a biblical no. sense. Yes, they a, yeah, a okay. person of the flesh but, cannot mm -hmm. please God. Yes. So According to Romans those eight. who in, but those who were in verse 37, they were pierced to the heart. And then they asked, they re, do you think that they did respond positively when he actually, uh, when Peter spoke the first gospel message, those who's pierced, those who had their hearts pierced? They said, brothers, what shall we do? Those, those people yeah, is that responding positively to the gospel message or is that living in dead that's, sin that's a in question. Adam? No, that's a, that's a mm -hmm. question of what do we do? Yeah, that, is that responding they're, positively? They're saying, what, what do we do? And so Peter gives them 
a response. Go ahead, Jeremiah. So, yeah, if you want to tackle that. I'll, I'll try to make this quick, Zachary. Um, so what shall we do is a Jewish people saying, what shall we do? Not because we just heard the best news possible and really happy. No, they understand that they've killed the son of glory, the Mashiach. And when they say, what shall we do? They understand they deserve the full wrath of God. So this is a covenantal Jewish context. And I just want to piggyback and say when they were cut to the heart, they now have a repentant heart that Peter cannot see. So he is telling them how to have their sins forgiven, repent, which they have a repentant heart now and demonstrate that repentance with a different kind of command, one in sanctification, which is where baptism belongs. Yeah, but you would say that they were, you know, they had that regenerate experience already in verse 37, they were cut, right? Verse 37 is where the Holy Spirit has transformed that mm -hmm. heart to a, a repentant faith, and now they can respond in baptism. Yeah, and then again, uh, do you think Peter, if somebody, because again, you're saying it's a Jewish yes, context. they would agree with me. Don't like it at all. Would you also agree that Peter would also say the exact same thing? If somebody that just heard the gospel message, that they were like, we killed the Mashiach, and then they're like, what shall we do? Like, oh my God, we messed up. We killed the one you're talking about, and they were cut to the heart. Do you think Peter shares that same perspective? 100%. He affirms the gospel of grace, which is by faith apart from works, and then the just shall live by faith. That's, okay, that's that, exactly so, what the scripture teaches. All right, perfect. So if that's the case, why did Peter command those who heard him preach the uh, preach to repent? The command is, uh, to repent is a verb in the imperative, suggesting it is an action that must be taken in the present rather than something already accomplished in the past. How is that possible if your views, if you believe the Jews in verse 37 were already saved and have already repented? Well, you're begging the question about what metanoia is. It's a change of heart and a change of mind that leads to fruits of repentance. And so Peter is being faithful to the Great Commission, where we are to go to all the worlds, preaching the good news, making disciples, and then commanding them to obey all that Christ has commanded us, and that would include baptism. So you're begging the question okay. with repentance. Um, I got you. Well, again, I think you're missing I mean, the point that, yeah. that, that Peter can't see the hearts of people. Like the Scripture says, like, I know my heart, God knows my heart. Nobody else knows my heart. I don't know your heart, so but God knows your heart. So when people say, they hear the gospel, and they say, brothers, what do we do? I, and again, Luke is going back and retelling what happened. Just But you're reading it, and you're trying to like make it, oh, so Peter should have known that their sins were already forgiven. They didn't have to do anything. That's not what we're saying. Repentant hearts, people who trust in God, always bear fruit, right? The Holy mm. Spirit bears the fruit, yeah. produces no, the fruit I, I in their understand. life. They just hold it up. I, I got you. So it's not I that, appreciate that. that he's like, I, oh, I'm just transition. Okay, I'll transition to a different question. At what specific moment was Paul saved when he called on the name of the Lord? I would say, like you said, when he believed and when he confessed and when he called on the name of the Lord, he when he identified him as, as Lord. So, so you would, I would say, say Paul I would agree with you. I would just take out your last step because mm -hmm. all of the yeah, other scriptures I provided for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got you. To, so again, you agree that... Yeah, so Paul calling on the name of the Lord by acknowledging yeah. Jesus as Lord, That's and that, so that's what he did. So that's him right. being saved. Now, do you believe Ananias shares the same understanding of calling on the name of the Lord as you do, as being, you know, praying okay. to Jesus? Once again, yeah, I would say that he has that same understanding. But again, mm -hmm. he doesn't know. He just knows he struck down blind. All he knows is Jesus called him, says, hey, man. And what Jesus sent him to do, if you read the text carefully, was not to go baptize him. What Jesus said to do is, I appointed you to go give him his sight back. If you look at Paul's own conversion in Galatians 1, he just says, I didn't receive it from any man. The gospel, I as I, you know, uh, not yeah. the one I, I teach, I received it through mm -hmm. a revelation of Christ. So, Gotcha. So, again, you, you would agree Paul, that, no. and I just want to get my point across. So, you, you do agree that Ananias shares the same understanding that if a person is truly praying to the Lord, that person has already called on his name and that person has already been justified and saved, right? I'm going to let the dog, he's got his hand up. I think he wants to put some. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be I'll be brief, Zachary. Yeah, because he used the word be baptized and wash away your sins. Um, Ananias is, he would have the Jewish understanding that it signifies these things and ceremonies has never forgiven sins. So he, of course, would take our view because he's not, he wouldn't have your understanding that baptism literally washes away, not past sins or, right. yeah. or all your sins, but he has the Jewish understanding of, of mikvah. Gotcha. All right. And I would so also say Ananias calls him brother. Do you call people yep. who are unbaptized brothers in Christ? 
So given that Ananias received a vision from Jesus confirming that Paul was praying to him, do you believe Ananias was fully convinced that Paul was truly praying to Jesus? Is that, ask that again. Given that Ananias received a vision from Jesus confirming that Paul was praying to him, do you believe Ananias was fully convinced that Paul was truly praying to Jesus? Or, or yeah, so you are you suggesting that Ananias might be believing that Jesus is lying to him? No, what I'm getting at is, do you he calls believe... him brother? Yeah, I believe that Ananias has the same understanding. That's why he calls him brother Adelphus, and which is a noun, a male believer understood as one's own sibling in God's family, sometimes used by any sibling, regardless of gender, in God's family. So, That's but, why so Ananias Jesus says, brother Saul, come yeah, in. No, I, I Go got ahead, you. John. I appreciate I that. Into this. So. Just, just really quick to clarify. So in Acts 9, 11, it says, And the Lord said to him, so this is when the Lord appeared to him in a vision. It says, Rise and go to the street called Straight to the House of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus, a, a name Saul, for behold, he is praying. Do you believe that Ananias was fully convinced that Paul was truly praying to Jesus? Yes or no? Dog, you got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, Yes, because verse 15, Go, for Paul is a chosen instrument of mine. That is why... Um, Ananias is going to say, come, be baptized, wash away your sins, because this is what a baptizer is supposed to do when baptizing, is to declare the gospel. So he's being consistent with, of course, this is a brother, someone who is justified by faith apart from works. We now preach the gospel to the watching world. I got you. So if calling on the name of the Lord means praying to Jesus, and Ananias knew Paul had already done that, why did Ananias still instruct him to wash away his sins by calling on his name? Because I'm a little confused. You're saying that his sins were already yeah. washed away, yeah. but if Ananias knew that he was truly praying to Jesus, which yeah. therefore means he was calling on his name, why is he telling him later to wash away his sins? Fishbone, you got to let because me Because Christians... Oh, okay, go ahead. Well, you are a little confused. Well, let me bring some clarity. Uh, calling upon the name of the Lord is not simply praying a prayer. It's a heart of worship. And we see that expressed in verse uh, 8 of Acts 22. And the reason why Ananias would say, come and wash away your sins, because he understands the Jewish understanding that it signifies the forgiveness of sins. And this is meant to be done to brothers, believers. And this is what true regenerate saints have always done in a baptismal ceremony is declare the gospel. That's what Ananias is doing. Okay, I got you. Okay, so is it is true saving repentant faith something pleasing to God? You got this fish. Is bone. true? What's that now? What's the question? Is true saving repentant faith? Because you've used the term like repentant faith. You know, is something pleasing to God? Is that pleasing to God's eyes? Yes. Yeah, so let me let me answer this again. The person of the flesh cannot please God. Romans eight, eight. So. So you that would agree with happen. my question. I just have one running out of time just so I can... So repentance and faith are evidence of a changed heart. God changes our heart, then repentance and faith, and then we move forward in what we were called to do. And so it's evidence gotcha. of a changed heart. Remember Deuteronomy, right, so, Deuteronomy so can, can an un I'm going to just cut you off there. I, I'm sorry about that. But can, you, uh, can an unsaved sinner perform actions that are pleasing to God, like saving, except, you know, having that repentant faith? Paul says nothing no. done in faith. It's no, okay, sin. so how sin. in your view does a spiritually dead sinner receive this saving repentant faith? By grace alone. Okay, so are you saying that the Holy Spirit might like it's it's the uh, the Holy Spirit regenerates the spiritually dead sinner, enabling them to have true saving repentant faith? Yes, that's what the scriptures clearly teach. Okay, so the process then is the spiritually dead sinner is first regenerated or raised to new life and and only then is given true saving repentant faith. Would you agree with that? That kind of order? No, the, first well, generation, then it says in Second Timothy chapter faith. 2 that God may perhaps grant them repentance. So it, it, repentance is even a gift of God. Faith is a gift of God. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the valley of dry bones. When you see a bunch of dead bones, do you think God can raise those? <clears throat> Who? Hey, yeah, only God, you, you only know. So he does it. That's but you what he would does. say, His but, but you would say that it's so regeneration, then Precedes saving faith, faith correct? Yes. Okay, so how, uh, so however, Colossians 2.12 states, you were also raised with him through faith. Doesn't this passage suggest that faith is the means by which one is raised? So we first have, uh, so we first have faith, then we're raised, according to Colossians 2.12.
Did you agree was with that? that? Was that late? You your, was that your was that Leighton Flowers? It says through faith, so that refutes. <laughs> that's uh, no. no, that's uh, Paul in Colossians two verse twelve. No, no. Oh, my bad. I, I thought it was Leighton Flowers. No, uh, you're misunderstanding Paul <laughs> because he's talking about a baptism made without hands. The fact that we can have uh, be justified through faith, well, that's a gift of God. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you for that. All right, Jeremiah, Trey, you're up next for your 25-minute cross-examination of Zachary and Andrew. And I'll start your time when you ask your first question. All right. I have so many questions. <laughs> Being that the title of this debate is that when you're baptized, you receive the forgiveness of all of your sins, past, present, and future. And when you bring up Hebrews 10, verse 14, right? I think it's verse uh, 14, that it was once for all, right? That he forgave all of our sins, all those sanctified. Let me go ahead and look it up. 10, 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. How in the world? Because you said you would like to debate this some other time, but we're going to do it right now. If Jesus Christ forgave all of your sins, past, present, and future, and you're now a Christian, and he has perfected for you, like you brought up this verse, for all time, those who are being sanctified, those Christians who are alive, and they're perfected for all time, how in the world can a Christian lose his salvation? Well, again, like what I've said is that this clearly is talking about the new covenant for those who are in Christ. That's where my main point is, which right. is those who are in Christ, forgiveness, you know, perfect in comparison, like I said, to the Old Testament. But again, okay. losing your salvation is something that the Bible does also speak about. And the reason that it's the only reason why is because that's the only circumstance. It's you losing your faith. So th th there are problems if you take the position that somebody, I mean, even in your position, I don't understand because you would always just go run to, you know, first John said they were never really saved. So oh. I, I understand. So, <laughs> so how, okay. So then you really don't believe that for by a single offering of Jesus Christ, that he has truly perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified, not those who have glorified, but those Christians on the ground. So you mm -hmm. think that no, truly he has not perfected for all time. Those who are, being uh, sanctified, that they actually can lose their salvation. So he didn't die for all of your future sins, maybe a lot of them, but there's one of them he didn't forgive. No, all those who are in Christ Jesus have received the justification. Okay, so Mark 16, 16, you don't believe Mark 16, 16, that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved? You think it means whoever believes and is baptized might be saved, could be saved, potentially can be saved, but not definitely will be saved in the end? No, I do believe Mark, uh, Matthew, uh, Mark 16, 16, for sure. Okay, so how can those who believe and are baptized, that says they will be saved, not could be saved because they might lose their salvation. So do you actually believe that you can lose your salvation or not? No, I believe the only circumstances, if you reject and fall away, just like Hebrews chapter 6 right. talks about those who have fallen so away. So Mark 16, so they, 16 in you order should say whoever believes and is baptized could be saved. Or has a chance no, to be it's, saved, it's, well, it's really those who believe. It, and again, it's something that they're supposed to do. So it's the believing. Again, in all of the Gospels, every single time the word believing is a verb in the active voice, meaning something that they're doing. So if you continually so, walk as he is in the light, you will be in Jesus. And you, you have don't in Jesus walk Christ, as he is in the you have light. complete forgiveness. Perfect. So let me ask you a question. No, but we're in like Christ. Your, your so story, we're us being in Christ. Like your story about you telling your son, believe me, son, I will be back in a minute. Are you expecting your son to do something or trust in something? Yeah, again, trusting, believing is a verb in the active tense. So that means that's something that you're doing. Just like, for example, when when the Bible talks about our even our thoughts can condemn us. Again, me looking at a woman with lust commits adultery in my heart. Therefore, that's something that God would judge. The Bible because says it's all about that the God heart, is going not to the judge the works. I know, but it's still, an, it, wouldn't you say that when someone, well, I wouldn't ask the question, but what I'm saying is that when somebody commits a <laughs> sin in their heart, God is judging their actions because it is something that they've done in their heart and God's the one that can see the heart. It's because God cares more about your heart than your actions. Uh, okay, I just, want to, I just want to make it clear. I'm going to punt this over to the dog real quick, but I just want to make it very clear. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, who are being sanctified. Repent, you know, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, not might be saved. I just have a hard time 
I, I just think it's very illogical and it contradicts itself when you say we'll be saved, but then you say, but you could lose yourself. You might not be saved. And he's perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified, but maybe not all time. So, Jeremiah, yeah, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer that as a question. But yeah, no, I do agree with the text. It does say that those, again, in the context, it's those in Christ, those in the new covenant have received the once and for all atoning sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ, unlike the right, continual Christian sacrifices. Yes, of course, those Christians? who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, only those who are in Christ Jesus are Christians. Hey, Zach? <clears throat> hey, Zach. How can you lose your salvation? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Jeremiah, go. Well, it's, I want to piggyback off this. So, Zach, is leaving the faith a sin? Um, I would say that leaving the faith would be a sin, yeah. Would that not be the future sin yeah. of leaving the faith, be washed away in baptism? Well, that's because you're rejecting what the offer is. So, right. again, if, Which if is God's given right? you that offer and you've rejected it, then, yes, you're no longer continually, just like it says, those who are being sanctified. So those who are continually, just like it says in First John, walking in the light as he is in the light. It's this continual walking, being in Christ. It's not just a one-time moment because I don't even think you would agree if a person truly, you know, in your mind was a Christian and then they fell away, you would probably just say that they never were a Christian in the first place. Whereas the Bible clearly says that those people have fallen away. You can't fall if you were never walking with. Uh, Zach, let, me, let me just hit this real quick, Jeremiah. Let me hit this real quick, Jeremiah. Can I hit this real quick? See, I think where the difference is between us, you think you're the one doing it. I'm not, we're not saying that you do it. We believe the scriptures here. And here's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. The reason he can make this offer right here and this promise that by a single offering, he is perfected for all time. Those who are being sanctified is because, like it says right here in First Thessalonians chapter 5, is God is the one who is sanctifying us. He will surely do it. So if it is a sin to walk away from the faith, which it is a sin, like you admitted, then you cannot tell people that Jesus Christ died for all of your future sins because you're not believing the scripture. It's because you're trusting in yourself, not in Christ alone. We trust that Christ, he will surely do it, sanctify us. That's why he can make this promise. Yeah. Go ahead. Jeremy. Yeah, but like I clear, like I clearly stated earlier, is that those who are in Christ, they have received the once and for all atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Again, there are passages that clearly state that those who were in Christ, they have fallen away. I understand you would have Zach, to reject those question. to hold your position. But yeah, of quick course. Quick question. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so in the moment of baptism for a person, was the potential for them uh, committing the sin to walk away also forgiven in baptism? Can you restate that again? Yeah. So in light of the proposition, uh, when someone is getting baptized and all of their sin is getting washed away according to your position, does that include the potential future sin of them walking away from the faith? Hmm. I mean, I would again say those who are in Christ, all their sins okay. are forgiven. And, uh, mm -hmm. Including the one of them apostatizing? I see again, in my mind, that would be a deeper understanding because that's them rejecting what God has offered. Just like when you look at Hebrews chapter 6, those who have tasted Maybe not that sin. Gift, they have That's fallen the away because again, those people have fallen. I believe that, you know, those who are in Christ, nobody can come and snatch them out, but that person can lose faith just like we've seen in Revelation. Right. Is that a sin? Is that a sin to lose faith? Again, it would be the rejecting of right. what is God that rejecting? has done. Is that sin? Yes or no? Yeah. Like I said, I, it would be okay. a sin. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I want to move on. I have on, a question. Oh, can I sorry, ask one quick? One, one quick okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, let, let me let me well, go ahead I'm just and gonna, keep this. Well, really, really, really quick. Who do you believe is doing the sanctifying? Are you sanctifying yourself, or is it the Lord sanctifying you? Like you mean in the work of sanctification? Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, in, I, I kind of view the same things like it's God, you know, it's us working out the, you know, our salvation, that, that sanctifying work leading up to glorification, just like you might say but that, but there that is a one-time moment just, in you justification. Just quoted, you kind of quoted Philippians chapter 2, even though it was out of context, the next verse says it is God who will, gives you the will and the power to actually do that. But do you think it's you doing the sanctification or God? 
no, again, sanctification is a work that we're doing again to, you know, I, I wouldn't say you could say maybe I know like you guys might say something like it's 50 50 or that's the when, when uh, me and God no, are we working not, together. So you wouldn't say, would say it's God it. now may okay, God of peace himself sanctify you. He will surely do it. Go right. ahead, Jeremiah. I'll let okay. him know. All right. So new set of questions. Uh, Zach, thank you so much for your kindness, man. I, I hope we're not coming across too fiery here. No, uh, I love it. My man. new thank question. You. My new question is, are individuals today saved the same way as individuals were in the Old Testament? I would say there's a new covenant. Uh, again, um, I would say that Jesus effectuates that by the, his, his cross, but there's a different, there's a new and living way that we have access to God. There's new circumstances that are, that is found in the new covenant. Again, the death, burial, and resurrection being now applied like baptism in the new Testament, you know, John is performing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But then after the death, burial, resurrection, there's a new understanding of this greater baptism okay. that Jesus is providing that those who are in Christ are being actually buried and, you know, raised with Jesus. So are you saying we're saved the same way as Old Testament saints, or is there a newer and better way? Is that your understanding of the new covenant? I, I definitely lean towards that. The new covenant does bring in a better hope. Like I've already shown in the old Testament, so that a there different were method of salvation that, yeah, so the sins in the Old Testament were continually being covered by the animal bloods, whereas now we have the once and for all perfection in Jesus Christ. So now those who are in Jesus Christ are now perfectly justified. So you so you believe in two Gospels, two different methods of salvation. Is that a correct understanding of your view? I mean, again, it's still always the same in the sense of that God had them to follow the law you know, follow these things. If they didn't, Wait. they were to be cursed. Wait. They were to be kicked out. They were so to, are we to, to follow that be... same law? No. So now we follow what's given okay. in the New Testament, just like Peter tells them to, in the imperative, he tells them to repent and be baptized in the imperative for the forgiveness of sins. I don't think right. that that exact phrase is found in the Old Testament, that exact that, same way for right. the forgiveness of sins. So that's why I would take the position that in the New Testament, we see this happening in the New right. Testament. Two different... In the two different methods of salvation you just said in the old testament they were to take they were to participate in ceremonies and be saved and now in the new covenant we it's the once finished sacrificed in christ so that's two different gospels wouldn't you agree no so again i would still say it's still like you are believing and doing i mean i've said already that belief is a verb okay. in the act yeah. of was something that you're yeah, yeah, doing yeah. just There's, like in the old testament they're still believing and doing something same thing in the new testament you're believing well, and doing well, so faith is a not active verb i'm not disputing believing and doing i'm disputing that we are not obeying the same list of commands like you're saying old testament saints did a different method a different gospel of salvation I mean, if, if there right? was an example that was given, I might be able to address that question a little bit further. Well, we don't have to get into example. We can talk about the concept. You either believe in one gospel that all saints have believed in, or you believe in two methods of salvation and two different gospels of salvation. What do you think? I mean, there's definitely something new in the new covenant. So that's, well, that's where I'm going. Is, is new a separate method of salvation, or is it something that brings greater, greater clarity of how salvation was accomplished in the Old Testament? Again, I would say in the New Testament, there is the complete forgiveness, unlike in the Old Testament. I don't think that there was a possibility for complete forgiveness of sins for those who are in the Old Covenant, unlike right. earlier, those who are in the Old Earlier, you said that in the Old Testament, they were forgiven by the sacrifices of, of blood. Do you agree? Is that what you're, you're saying? No, it was a continual covering. So Yom Kippur was a continual covering of those sacrifices. It, in Hebrews chapter so, 10, it shows you that it wasn't actually, it never actually effectuated what it was intended for. Exactly. So when were those sins actually forgiven of the Old so Testament? So again, yes, I would believe that the Old Testament saints, you know, Jesus Christ, his blood did cover them as well in regards to at the cross. But Again, being in that old covenant, for example, one had to be circumcised and keep the Passover for the the uh, the proselytes to come into that covenant for them to effectuate those promises and blessings because the Torah was a blessing and a curse. But you had to first be in the covenant, be a sojourner amongst Israel, just like today, so, in order to effectuate the promises of the new covenant. You have to be in. Well, you think Christ. by their doing, so by them doing something, it effectuates the relationship with God. That's what causes 
God to love them is because of their obedience. Yeah, because believing is something that one is doing. That's why it is in the verb and it is active. It's something that you are doing. It's not passive. I would love for you to show me in the book of John somewhere where it says that belief is I don't think you believe the book of John. Word. I you do keep saying that. Yes. Okay, let me ask you if, real quick, just because we're here. Can I do that real quick? Go John, um, yeah, Jeremiah? absolutely. Absolutely. Go to John, the uh, chapter 22, I guess it is. Uh, let me turn there. Uh, John chapter 20, I'm sorry, verse 30 and 31. It says, now Jesus did, now you know that no, I don't think even repentance is required in the book of John. Nowhere is the baptism of Jesus Christ in the book of John. But John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31 says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. Do you believe that that's the reason the Holy Spirit wrote the book of John? And that by believing in Jesus Christ, you may have eternal life in his name? Yeah, so verse 31 says that, but these are written so that you may believe, again, that is a verb in the subjunctive active second person plural, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that be, by believing, again, is a verb in the present participle active. So again, it's something that okay. they are doing, which I don't think but that you don't you have to. So believe you don't that. believe that you have to. So you, you do agree. So you don't have to be baptized in order to have eternal life in his name. Again, one has to believe, and what does it entail to believe? It's to follow what he said, in regards but to how one receives full faith. Can you can can someone read the book of John and come to saving faith and eternal life by believing in Jesus Christ? It says the reason this book was written, yeah, is so that just you like can read you said earlier, book and, and believe. And yeah, and just like you said earlier, that repentance isn't found in the book of John. You won't find that, but you would look at the book of Acts and say, "Look, you have to repent." It's it's a command in the imperative to repent, but you're saying that that's a part of the but, regeneration. So it doesn't say I'm that either believing. here. It's saying that believing is something that you're actively doing which I don't believe you, you believe that repent, uh, believing is something given to you. It's not something that you're doing. Believing is, but according to this in the Greek, it's something that you are doing, not something that's being done to you or given to you. That's fine. Let me ask you, it doesn't say that you have to be baptized though. Do I mean, you believe it, the book it of John, say, the reason is written? It, it doesn't say you have to believe that Jesus is this is is this you know the Trinity the, the word the Trinity or the the doctrine of of <laughs> okay that hey, that's fine go ahead, with your, go ahead with your question uh, other things that you I just need want to, to believe I would like for that to be understood too but okay so the you. book of John is incomplete and the Holy Spirit's wrong that it you that's not why the book was written go ahead no John. we take the whole counsel of God again Jude once is that the uh, the once for all faith that was delivered to the saints and again Jesus in okay. the book of John is well I'll just make a, this point if Paul did not the know the full Spirit gospel coming upon them do you think that you have to have the whole Bible to, in order to be a Christian to know everything to do to be saved no to just to be saved? a Christian all you need to know is I would say is the Gospels and the book of Acts after that, how to after that is um, again like how to like you don't need to know every single finite detail. All you need to know is who Jesus is, and all you need to do is believe in who He is. You know, you already know. Repent, so the book of Acts is written. Mind, the book of Acts is written in about sixty-five and, A.D. So what happened to all those people before that if they had to have the book of Acts in order to be saved? Again, the, the gospel message is very fast and clear. Like you just say again, like I said, who is Jesus Christ? You have to believe in that he's, you know, I believe that you have to say he's, he's God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is the great I am. And he died, buried, resurrected on the third day. You have to believe in what he did. Then you have to repent, change your mind as it is said in the imperative, something that you're going to do. And then you're going to confess Jesus as Lord. And you're going to be baptized, which is something that is passively done to you. Right. So again, even talking about walking to the baptistry or getting up again, and that's not baptism. What is Jeremiah, baptism? It's Jeremiah, you want to go with your next uh, question? Okay. Uh, go ahead, Jeremiah. Andrew, you know, I mean, I would love to hear a little bit. And Zach, you're doing a fantastic job. I appreciate it. But I have a question out of the book. Thank of you. Romans, if you want to chime in there. Uh, so look with me real quick uh, to Romans 3, 27. Paul says, yeah, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded by what kind of namas law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. What's your understanding when Paul says the law of faith there? Um, let's see here. Hear that again. 
So wall, cut the wall forks. No, cut the way. So this is talking about, is this talking about how we're justified by the works uh, of faith and not the works of the law? Is that, is that what we're talking about here? Are, are you asking me about the, con the broader context? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm assuming, well, I don't want to take your time. Maybe just clarify for me a little bit. Well, I'm asking your understanding of what Paul means by the law of faith there. So the law of faith, I would say... Without having really looked at it, I, I would think it, it makes my, it makes my mind think of the First Corinthians. I think it's First Corinthians nine. I, I can't remember the exact verse twenty one. I can't remember where Paul talks about how he's not under the law uh, of, of the old law, but he's under the the new law, the law of Christ. So I would say. Do you think that's the same? Do you think that's the same context here? Do you think that's still the same context here? Paul's using in Romans three. Well, I know in Romans 3, in verse 20, he talks about, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. I would say that's talking about the Mosaic law. I'm not sure if you agree with me or not on, on that. So are you, but what's the are law of faith law here? Of Where then is boasting? Is it excluded by what kind of law? Of works? No. Or by law of faith? Yeah, I would say it's it's not by the Mosaic law, but it's by the new covenant law, the, the, the new law of Christ. It, it, that's it's that law by which we're justified. It's the new covenant. Thank law. you. So what your understanding is that Christians, Paul saying we are in no way, shape or form under the law of the works of Moses. Yes, uh, Paul in Romans, Romans seven verses four through six, Paul clearly says that we've been released from the law and he clarifies what okay. he's talking about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate it. So look with me early at verse 19. Paul says, now we know that whatever the law, so to be consistent in your view, this would be the, the entirety of the Mosaic law, all 613 commandments, as it speaks to those who are under the law. Now you're saying that's not Christian. That's not Paul here, right? When you say that's not Paul here, like, yes, I'm talking about those under the law. Those who are under the law talk about the Jews, people who are trying to keep the law of Moses. Right. You're, you're saying Jews, not Gentiles. But the problem is so that every mouth may be stopped. Now, you're saying just Jewish mouths, and I would continue to say, and the whole world may be accountable to God. Now, earlier in the context, Paul says, well, we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles are under sin because— a part of the Mosaic law is the moral law that is still binding on us today, or do you reject that we're no longer under the moral law? I say we're, yes, I think we're under the law of Christ, which has moral laws within it, but we're not under the law that the Gentiles were under outside of uh, the Israelites so, in the Old Testament. Time. So we're, we're no longer uh, under we're love under the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Well, if we love God, we keep his commandments and, his, and part of his commandments is to love your brother and love your neighbor. Right? That's that's in first John. Where, like the, where's, these are where's that? Are. Where's that verse come from um, to love God and love neighbor? Yeah. So just so, yes, uh, I think is it Deuteronomy? I know, I know it's in the Old Testament, right? Deuteronomy uh, and Leviticus. Like, Deuteronomy and Leviticus. OK, I, I thought Deuteronomy, I'm not sure about Leviticus, but yes, um, just because something is in the Old Testament, if it is repeated or quoted in the New Testament, it may or may not be carried over. Just like I'm in the United States, therefore I'm under U.S. law. I'm not under the, the laws of Canada, right? I don't live there, but there may be overlapping laws, right? Even though I'm not under Canadian law, it's still illegal. As far as I know, it's illegal to murder there, just like it's illegal to murder here, right? But I'm not under So my law. question, but yeah, but what I'm asking about is does the moral law still stop the mouths of everyone today? Yeah, well, yes, and the law of Christ, okay. I think. Question. Because Question. Of what... If the more law still stops the mouths of people today, does that mean you can perfectly love God in obedience to being baptized? Are you able to perfectly fulfill that moral law? No, I'm not. No one is able to perfectly fulfill the law. That's why we have to be baptized passively. Baptized into Christ, like Galatians 2, 16 talks about, we're saved by the faith of Christ in the genitive. It's his faith. It's the faith that belongs to Christ. 
that's what we're saved. That's why I need to be baptized into him to be saved by his faith. Because my faith can never be perfect enough. Right, because by trying to obey the moral law, even if it's a new command in the New Testament, you are taking us back to the moral law that shuts our mouths. So I'll throw it over to you, Trey, at yep. the last minute. Uh, yeah, Galatians 2.16, you said? Yes, I believe that's... Uh, the person's not justified by works of the law, but second. through faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, it's uh, in the genitive faith of but you Christ. Said, but you said the faith of Christ. So... Yes. Or um, I think it says, but we're saved through faith in Christ. So we also believed in well, Christ in Jesus faith. in order to be justified Sorry. by faith. Sorry, was that a question? Sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you and interrupt there. Are we saved? We're saved by his faith? Let's yes. Say, this should say saved by the... a person is justified by works of the law. Not by justified by works of the law, but we are justified. You're saying it's saying we are justified through the faith of Jesus. Yes. All right. Okay. Okay. That's time right there. That's time. Hey, Andrew, in the future, you might want to get some headphones, buddy, because I think what's going on is that as Jeremiah or Trey is speaking, their vocals is coming through your speaker and your noise cancellation on your computer is not moving as fast as it should. And so it's it's okay. causing that echo to feedback. So in the future, just make sure you get some headphones. You'd be good to go, man. All right, uh, that's how we're moving to closing statements. And once again, these are five minute closings uh, for each team. And so Zachary, Andrew, you guys are back in the seat for your five minute closing. And once again, I'll start your time as soon as you guys begin to speak. Hey, Zach, I think you're, I think you're muted. I think you're muted, Zach. All right, yes, okay. All right, you can hear me now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, perfect. I can hear Sorry you. Let me hold on. Let me let me set your time real quick, Zach. Hold on one second. Why's it doing that? Hold up. Maybe I gotta do it like that then. All right, go ahead, Zach. You got it for five minutes. All right, thank you. So yeah, uh, again, a lot of fun, a lot of stuff being thrown out, but I want to just bring up this idea of believing. Again, I, I've kept mentioning it's something that is a verb in the active voice, meaning it's something that you're actively doing. It's not something that has been necessarily given to you. It's something that you're doing. So when John 20 verse or 21 or yeah, 20 verse 31 says, but these are written so that you may believe it's something that you're doing. You're going to believe because it's a verb in the present active that you, that Jesus is the son of God. And that by believing Right there again, it's something in it's an active verb. So again, I don't think that that's been addressed. But again, that's something that they're doing. Again, also looking at e even the idea of um, baptism. Again, we're not saying baptism is something that you're at, you know, the walking or me getting up and doing it. See, baptism is always used except for uh, Acts 22 verse 16, because it's in the middle, because the middle voice, because that's Paul recounting of what he, what had happened to him. But if you look at the original account in Acts chapter nine, the, 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 the baptism that he undergoes is something that's passive because it's not him doing it. It's being done to him. Again, that's why baptism is not actively something you're doing. It's actually the passive. So again, looking at that, um, we've brought up Again, falling away, things of that nature. Again, the idea is those who are in Christ have complete forgiveness. However, the Bible also talks about that you have to continually walk as he is in the light. Again, I don't think the Calvinist position can actively answer those questions about falling away, looking at that phrase, actually falling away, because you always have to understand that, oh, well, that person really wasn't saved. So I don't think that that's a good point. Also, uh, again, Acts to, uh, 22 and the conversion of, of of Paul. I mean, in my mind, it's pretty clear. I understand there's a lot going on, but calling on the name of the Lord is something that according to Jeremiah and Trey is something that he already did by praying to Jesus and calling him Lord. Whereas then the inspired man, Ananias, comes and says, hey, you need to rise and be baptized wash away your sins calling on his name but he already knew that he was praying to the lord so again just showing you that it, there's not consistent argument there again clearly paul had st he still had his sins because he had not yet washed away his sins by calling on his name give it to brother andrew 
again, thanks for having us on. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, Marlon, thank you. Thank you. Trey, Jeremiah, thank you all for being here. They wanted to do this with us. I just hope everyone was able to see uh, the inconsistent answers that we received on with Cornelius in, in Acts 10, and also their answer on the gift of the Holy Spirit being for the forgiveness of sins, which again would confirm our position in Acts 238, that repentance and baptism uh, were possible, where people could actually do those things or have them done to them, repent would be, was in a par imperative in the active and baptism is uh, in the passive. So they could choose to repent and submit themselves to being baptized uh, in the passive uh, prior to receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, which as we've heard, uh, that's the point where sins are forgiven, which again, just confirms our position. But I don't really have anything else uh, I wanted to say. Again, just, just thank you all for being here. Uh, my bonus to do this. I'll just give up the rest of my time here. Uh, I'll, I'll take that time. Um, and, and looking at, you know, looking at Cornelius, I mean, he's also doing something that according to their position, you only can do by, by actively praying to Jesus, you know, being a God fear. These things are pleasing to God. This man has not yet been regenerated by the Holy Spirit because he receives the Holy Spirit after Peter comes to him and speaks words in which he will be future tense saved. But he's doing things like praying to Jesus. So again, those things are done prior to. So in my mind, it doesn't make any sense. How can one say that Cornelius was doing things that only saved people do, but then he wasn't saved until later? And again, it clearly shows you that when you look at the uh, in Acts chapter 11, how you're connecting it back to again, like in my mind, it doesn't make any sense. So I don't think it was answered properly. I mean, again, I really enjoyed this dialogue. I mean, again, this is um, the time is really quick, but I mean, again, all this awesome stuff, again, just looking at what we've presented, I don't think when it talks about the baptism and believing it was addressed properly. Um, and again, I thank you again so much and God bless. Lynn. <clears throat> all right. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, I, about I, must, uh, I was muted. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll start your five minutes. You guys are, your closing remarks five minutes in. I'll start your time and you be in the speak. Yeah. All right, I'm going to start really quick. So I'm sorry you don't understand it. There are verses for that as well. But um, the inconsistencies, I think the inconsistency is when you say that, you know, when the Bible's clear that we're saved just like Abraham is saved, Romans 4. Abraham was saved this way. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But his words counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus Christ. Therefore, since verse five, chapter 5, verse 1, we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God. Either we do or we don't, and we do, because we're saved just like Abraham was saved. I think it, the inconsistency is that, look, Every you know, Jesus died, and once you're baptized, you're forgiven for all of your past, present, and future sins, mm. all of them. But you can still lose your salvation. I think we showed you. I think it was very clear, and it's this is what's heartbreaking to me, really, coming from the Church of Christ. My heart for those people is they think it's their doing, and they're the ones sanctifying themselves. You're never going to find that in Scripture. It's always God doing it. God will surely do it. Read the last few verses of Thessalonians chapter five that God is going to be the one sanctifying you. That's why he can promise you that He that Christ, because of his once for all sacrifice, he is perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. So I think it's just very illogical and very can, just not even honest when you say that Jesus died for all of your sins, past, present, and future, for those who are in Christ. Well, okay, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. So now that you're in Christ, guess what? You're being perfected for all time because all your sins forgiven but you can't say you can still lose your salvation unless you're trusting in yourself and your own works and not Christ alone. That's heartbreaking to me. I think that's very clear. Um, yeah, I'll give you three minutes. If I have anything else, I'll raise my hand. Thanks, Mr. Bone. Well, I mean, that's the big inconsistency tonight is you kind of heard Zachary's answer. Well, 
that that future sin of walking away well we it's kind of a sin but it you know that that's on you and it's like well that's why your your future sins can't be washed away in baptism um he said believing is something that you are doing well we're compatibilists right it, that faith that is a gift from god the holy spirit now indwells us and causes us to continue to believe and yes, we'd say that believing is something we are experiencing, but not something we're doing by our works. We addressed that it was not hard. Uh, baptism is always in the passive, yes, but you're begging the question about what ceremonies looked like in the Jewish mind when it signified spiritual realities. That was never touched on, never addressed, because you know we're right. This goes all the way back to the Torah. When high priests uh, were fully bathed in water that never washed away sin or literally caused them to be unclean in, term, in terms of the forgiveness of sins. That is the continuity that Jews in Acts chapter 2 would have understood. Be baptized for the remission of sins. This would have pictured a likeness of being united with Christ and his authority. So that's the whole thing. Yes, is there a moment in that ceremony that you're passive? Absolutely. But I guess in your mind, don't let anybody confess Jesus as Lord and say that they trust in him or answer any questions or literally move in the baptistry because, uh-oh, now you're ergon. Now your works are now at play. Acts 22, 16 was brought up. Once again, they beg the question of be baptized and what it means to wash away sins. It's not literal. It signifies the washing away of sins signifies the moment that you are justified positionally before God. They are confusing the representation for the reality. Ananias is being a faithful Christian, proclaiming the gospel in this ceremonial um, context that is picturing the gospel. Cornelius is easy because he's a God fearer. He is an Old Testament regenerate saint who doesn't know that Jesus of Nazareth is the one that forgives sins. So he's a god fear. Of course, he can pray to God because he is regenerate under Old Testament standards. In Acts chapter 11, what does it mean that he was saved? Well, he was saved in the one, name one of thing. Jesus of Nazareth. Go ahead. Right. So 50 seconds. And to say that, the, that to call the name of the Lord means baptism. So I'm assuming here in uh, Genesis chapter 4, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to get baptized into Jesus Christ. Nope, it says to call on the name of the Lord. That's when they had heart changes. That's when they started coming to the Lord Jesus Christ with a heart change of repentance and looking to him in faith and faith alone to be saved by him and Trey, not that, their own works. That was a different gospel. That was a different method of salvation. <laughs> yeah, so to say that call on the name of the Lord means, that means equivalent equals to baptism. It's just not. Not true. I'll give you 10 seconds. Thanks, get, brother. It, get it, dog. Oof, oof. No, no. no. Hey, you thank you all so seconds. much. I did, I, I did appreciate this whole debate. It was fun. Thank you so much, Marlon. Thank you so much, um, y'all, for being on here with us. All right. Thank you guys as well for a fantastic debate. You guys definitely kept it under control. And I was expecting Jeremiah to get a little wild, you know, because Jeremiah's a wild dude. Especially when uh, uh -huh. he talk about bat he keeps he keeps challenging me to basketball and you know he, he go learn one day post you he up go learn post one day. <laughs> All right, good stuff, guys. So we go jump into this uh, this uh, Q and A. We got twenty minute Q and A, guys, and we go jump in here with the first question of the evening mm -hmm. and uh, rules to the Q and A, guys. Uh, both you guys once again, if you get, both teams will get one minute each. It's kind of hard to read. I understand you guys are squinting your eyes. I'll read it as many times as you guys need me to read it. Uh, but the rules are both you guys get once both teams will get one minute each to respond to the question. All right, and uh, let's get into it. All right, so first question here is coming from Living by the Way. Is there a difference be, be of being baptized from for sin? in comparison to baptized to be saved. He didn't put a name to a team, particularly, particularly to the question. So Jeremiah, Trey, you guys want to tackle this one first? Yeah, is there a difference of being baptized for sin or in comparison to being baptized to be saved? Um, I don't think that you getting dunked in water is going to save you, period. I think it's you're saved by faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Go ahead, Jeremiah. Yeah, well, baptism doesn't justify you before God positionally. That's by faith. And when we read 1 Peter 3.21, that baptism now saves you, well, it saves you in type, right? Because it signifies that reality. But baptism is part of our sanctification, but it never justifies or regenerates an individual. So that's those are the proper categories that have to be understood, that baptism, if you believe that your participation in baptism justifies you before God, well, now you are adding your working participation 
as the means to be made right with God. Well, Galatians 1, to the Judaizers, those that are looking to the Old Testament law, well, you've obliterated the gospel of grace. You are falling away from the gospel of grace because you are trying to add something that you can do and participate to the finished work of Christ. All right, Zachary and Andrew. Um, yeah, I mean, in my mind, it's baptism is to be saved because in Acts chapter 2, that's what the text says. It's for the forgiveness of sins. Looking at, you know, they brought up uh, Mark 16, 16, believing and baptized is that you will be saved. So that's how I, that's how I would kind of look at that. But uh, Andrew, you have anything? Well, just, yeah, just with the Mark 16, 16 that you brought up regarding this question, if I'm not mistaken, Mark 16, 16, both the belief and baptism, uh, Pistua and Baptizo, are both in the aorist tense. They have both come prior to the future tense salvation there. So I think the NASB translates it correctly. He who, uh, the one who uh, has been baptized and or has, has believed and has been baptized shall be a uh, future tense saved. So they both come prior to salvation. I think that probably connects with that. So I, I don't think there's a difference. Um, in this. All right. And this question is for Zach and Andrew. And uh, do you do you take the Eucharist? If so, is it is it remembrance or real presence? It's kind of off topic a little bit, but oh man, not really. <laughs> I mean, taking communion, yeah, it's that would question. be a representation of you know what's happening. You know, uh, again, I wouldn't call it the Eucharist because I don't think it's the literal body of Jesus Christ. But that would be uh, not literal. Yeah, Jesus says, "Do this in remembrance of me." So I would say remembrance. All right, Trey and Jeremiah. Yeah, I would say Go, this is a good hermeneutical, good hermeneutical lesson right here. Context is king, right? And so, if you're going to say things, well, it says this, and that's what it means. That's going to be bad hermeneutics because it says here, Jesus says, "This is my body. This is my blood." But you look at that and you say, well, it's actually a representative. There you go. There's your answer for baptism. This is for the forgiveness. Of, well, it's representative of the true spiritual reality that it represents. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, Lutherans would be mad at y'all's interpretation because they're going to say, no, 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 both baptism and the, the Eucharist or Lord's Supper is both instrumental in forgiveness of sins. It's our position that says, well, what is a ceremony, especially in the Jewish mind? It signifies these things. Not one time in this whole debate did y'all address that point, in my opinion, because you can't. You mentioned Mark 16, 16, that you must believe and be baptized in order to be saved future. Well, you must be justified by faith, by believing, and that you have to work out your salvation and baptism and all that he's commanded us. And salvation is future tense in terms of our glorification. Plus, they don't believe that you will be saved, but you could be. All right, all right. And we have a question here. This is for um, Jeremiah and... Trey, let's go. All right, uh, question thoughts that the thoughts that whoever allows himself to be baptized on the strength of his faith is not only uncertain but also an idolaters who deny Christ for the trust in. And uh, I think the second part to this question, uh, on mm. something of his own, namely a gift. Which has from which has from God that is faith and not on God's word alone. I, I think it's a quote is from that Martin. a word it's salad? A, yeah, it's a quote from Martin Luther. Um, but if I can sort of summarize the question to sort of capture sure. what he's trying he's trying to ask sure. her, um, I believe that the question is sort of kneeling on the concept of being baptized within one's own strength versus being baptized by God's power. If that if I'm Sort of summarizing it correctly. I think that's sort of what it's capturing. And can you hit the second part of that? Yeah. Uh, namely a gift which is from God. Yeah, so I mean, I think what, what Luther, listen, I, 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 I feel sorry for John Calvin. He gets such a bad rap because Luther had a beard in his hand. He was angry. He was, he was ready to fight. You know what I'm saying? And so Luther even says, if you looked at the cross, if you just looked at the cross and you think by your own intellect and logic that you come to understand Christ, you're not saved because it's nothing of you. So I think what he's saying here with Luther is saying, if you think that you're coming to him and you're going to get baptized and do all this stuff to please him, like, dude, you're an idolater. 
And so, of course, once again, it's not what you do. Christ alone. Mm. So go ahead, Jermon. Mm. Well, as much as I love and respect Martin Luther, I'm not a Lutheran for a reason. Uh, I believe in Semper Reformanda, baby, because I believe there is more reforming that needs to happen. One thing that I love that Martin Luther got right was justification is by faith alone. Now, I think what Martin Luther inherited from Rome was exactly what our interlocutors are saying, that you do nothing in your baptism. This is merely the expressed word. And the problem is, uh, then you no longer can ex- you can no longer um, express your faith in your action. If you participate at all, will you now have worked to some degree? All right, uh, Zach and Andrew, any thoughts? Honestly, this question is one above my head, to be honest. I mean, I- Andrew. I can respond. I mean, I mean, I could respond to what Jeremiah just said. But I don't think that's this part of the discussion. Do so it. I don't Do think it. I have any time for this. <laughs> I dare you. Jeremiah's like, I, I dare know. you. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, we'll just move on to the next question, though. I uh, understand that question sort of. It's a lot to that question, so uh, it's all good. It's all good. So we'll move on to the next question here, and this question is for Zach and Andrew. The question is: Is is salvation a work of God alone? Or of God and man. Well, I would say According again. To, yeah. Oh no! Go ahead. You go ahead. No, you got it. You got it. You go. Well, I was just gonna say, according to Philippians one, it's both. According to Philippians one verses four through six, it is it involves your participation in it from the beginning, and that's why God's gonna bring it to completion because of your participation in it from the beginning or from the first until now. And based on their continued participation in it, just like First Corinthians 15, they're being saved. It's a continual process if, conditional word, if they hold fast, if they continue in. So, And I would just say, again, believing we've shown that the word pistuo, you know, John chapter 20, verse 31 is something that you do. It is a verb in the active. Again, I don't know how else that could be taken. If that's something that you're doing. All right. Uh, uh, Jeremiah, any thoughts? All right. Here's what Fishbone's going to say. Philippians 1 6 does not say anything what you just said, Andrew. It says, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in mm. you, not you and him, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of the Jesus Christ. Again, you are saved forever, the Christian. And then he says this. Now, he does say this in verse 29 for it's been granted to you two mm. things for the saved Christ. You should not only believe that was granted to you, but also suffer. So those are the ten, two things granted to you. So no, it, it's it's salvation is, is God, God alone, mono, mono, jism, mm, mono, mm, jism, mm. right? Mono, jism. Yep. So yep. can I follow yep. up with that fishbone? Yep. And it, those whom it. God in the past tense predestined, he also called. For those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified are those, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Just like Trey. That's not fair, that, It's not. Well, I mean, I just, that's Paul, you know, so I just had to throw that in there. All right, all right. Moving on to the next question. Moving on to the next question here. Uh, this question is coming from Deneen. Thank you, Deneen, for the question. This question is for both. Uh, when scripture speaks of baptism, is it always referring to something done in water? Uh, she did. It's for also, uh, I guess, Jeremiah Trey, you guys want to take this one first? Uh, yeah, go ahead. So when it says that Israel was all baptized into Moses, well, I don't think they were literally baptized in Moses. They were identifying themselves with Moses and the things he was saying when Jesus says, I have another baptism to go through. He's not talking about getting dunked in water. He's talking about the cross and going there. And so it signifies different things. That's a quick answer. Jeremiah, take the 30 seconds. Well, Trey did a good job of saying uh, there are multiple kinds of baptisms, different ways of being immersed. The question is always into what context. But when we're talking about the ceremonial white uh, right immersed into water, well, of course, something is being done. You have a baptizer who hopefully is declaring the gospel of grace like Ananias was. And you have another person expressing their faith with a particular action and getting into the font. And many of those people, like the Apostle Paul, like many people, they are confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior in their baptismal bath. But that signifies a work that God has already done in their heart and in their life. 
All right, Zachary and Andrew. Yeah, I would agree that there are multiple kinds of baptisms like Trey and Jeremiah just brought up. But specifically what I was dealing with was, again, the right context is being immersed into Christ. And that is where justification lies in Christ. Unlike the Old Testament <laughs> continual animal sacrifices in Christ, you have the once and for all animal sacrifice, uh, the true sacrifice that is way better than the animals according to the Old Testament. Yes, I uh, I agree. Multiple different baptisms. Of course, you've got Ephesians 4, 5. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, which uh, is not a contradiction because I believe it's talking about one baptism that saves. Just like there's one many Lords, but there's one Lord who saves. There's one system of faith that saves, even though there's many different religions. So in the context, there is one baptism that saves. I'm ho hoping that we defended that tonight. Uh, but yes, many different types of baptisms in Scripture. All right, all right. And moving on to the next question here, and this question is for Zach and Andrew, coming from the tad at theologian himself. What's going on? All right, Woo -woo. question. There he is for for Zach and Andrew. Is Abraham, who we look at as an example to be justified? Was for Andrew, Abraham Zach. an example that we look to? What was Abraham an example that we look to to be justified? Yes. And um, yes, in this in the sense that uh, Abraham was saved apart from the works of the law and apart from circumcision in a religious uh, in a religious right and religious sense. Uh, also, James two twenty one was not our father Abraham justified by Aragon, Dikaio by Aragon. Um, yes, yes, he was. The, his faith was completed, perfected. It reached the goal, the telos, the telios, the teliao. Uh, there it was perfected the scripture was fulfilled abraham believed god it was fulfilled it was brought to completion or perfection when he offered up his son isaac had, had nothing to do with the mosaic law had nothing to do with circumcision so yes he is our example uh, to have saving obedient faith all right uh jeremiah trey yeah it breaks my heart andrew's answer to that i'll tell you of course he's he is because he was saved because he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteous, not his works. Of course, it wasn't the law of Moses because he predated Moses 400 to 600 years prior. So that's why it had nothing to do with the law of Moses. He was saved by faith, just like everybody in the Bible has always been saved by faith. And everybody in the future will be saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Yeah, and that's where it gave Andrew a little bit of fits earlier when I asked him about Romans 3.27. It's not the principle of works, which the entirety of the Mosaic law rested on, that justifies a person. No, it's the principle, the namas of faith. That is how Abraham was justified positionally before God by his, his firm trust. And then we see that that is the same way that Christians all— there's only been one way of salvation, one gospel. The Old Testament saints trusted in the Messiah to come, and we, look, we trust in what Messiah has accomplished and finished. All right, all right. And here's a final question right here. We'll have two more questions here and then we'll, we'll close it out for the night. Um, uh, why did Philip baptize a eunuch after he believed? What would be the point? That's a question for you, Jeremiah and Trey, what you guys got? For, for Jeremiah and Trey, <laughs> one of you guys. Okay, I'll, I'll start it off. Um, well, the just shall live by faith. I mean, this this is kind of, I mean, I just want people to hear. Uh, if he, Philip preached the gospel of grace to the eunuch, he would have received that gospel in faith, therefore justified, and then he would demonstrate his faith by action and his participation in the command to be baptized. So we're justified by faith apart from works, and then we live in sanctification to the glory of God before the watching world. Yeah, look, here's the deal. Again, no Jewish person believed that the physical, the ones who were saved by God, no, they didn't think that the circumcision of the flesh actually did anything. It was just a sign that pointed to the spiritual reality. Now, the legalist people thought them doing the action is what made them right with God. Same thing with baptism, new covenant, new sign, baptism. Baptism is a sign of the true spiritual reality of God changing your heart, putting you in covenant community with God and his people. The legalist would say, no, the action itself is what did it. All right, Zach and Andrew. Yeah, I would just say this is a, the same thing that we see in Acts chapter two. The people they hear the gospel, they believe it, 
and then they, you know, repent, confess, and they're baptized. So right here you can see he preaches him Jesus. He sees water, what forbids him from getting baptized, because that's what's connected. When you preach Jesus, you preach water baptism because it is in the means of water baptism. And when you are immersed into Jesus and you're united with him and therefore die with him and have been justified, Romans 6, 7. All right. I'm good. Andrew? I'm, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. All right. Yeah, and we're going to end on sort of a funny note. Uh, the an, an unapologetic cat uh, this wants to know if Jeremiah's beard is real. <laughs> <clears throat> this this beard signifies a greater reality of a beard, actually. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. It does look kind of paste. It does look hey, kind of pasted I, I, on I like, Jeremiah. It does. I like. No, God, God gave that's, it to him. That's a real beard. <laughs> hey man, no, Zach, you got the real. Zach's beard. coming around. The, Zach's coming around. The, Zach, good yeah, job. You got that. Zach about to have that Calvinist beard soon, man. You're gonna be reformed here soon, That's right? Man. You're gonna be reformed <laughs> for you. Hey, just hey, be careful reading the Bible, Zach, because you're gonna be reformed if you do. Or you can just, go, you can just have that. You can just have that goatee like me, man. You know, you can yeah, that is satisfying. <laughs> Look, I got, I got the hair like you because I think. Yeah, that's I know, you, right? Yeah, fresh look. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, man. Ain't never all be a ball, man. You hey, know what I'm saying? What's up? Marlon, thank you so much. But um, this was fun. But can you tell your brother from another mother, Travis Thomas, I said hello? Uh, <laughs> stop. <laughs> Y'all be killing me, man, with him, man. Y'all killing me. He killing me. But I, on that note, I'm out of here, man. I'm about to just log off on that note. Nah, but uh, good stuff, guys. I appreciate you guys so much, man. I really did. Really do. It's sort of late on you guys' side, man. So you guys go ahead and get some rest. And uh, clock out for the night. Knock out. So I appreciate you guys once again. Uh, with that said, uh, you guys have any, like, closing words as far as deep party words for each other before I let you guys go, man? Started with yeah, Zach, and I guess, and I guess Jeremiah and Trey, what you got? So I just want to I thank say, Marlon. Thank you for ahead. letting me uh, come back on. Um, I just want to encourage people, if you want to check out some more of my content, please go to the Apologetic Dog YouTube channel. I have a website also where a big part of my ministry is evangelizing the Church of Christ with the Gospel of Grace. Um, I also have mm -hmm. a lot of eschatology content on there as well. Um, got a lot of upcoming content, a lot of um, awesome episodes, and so I just want to um, encourage people if you don't, if you haven't seen um, our ministry, me and Trey do a lot uh, together. We we say what about it, and then we get into it. Thanks so much for letting me come on, Marlon. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, thank you. Love the people in the Church of Christ. Hope you just read the Bible, read it slowly, read it in context, and um, praying for you. Thank you, Marlon. It was just fun. Right. Zach and Andrew. Yeah, uh, I also, you know, thank you guys a lot for letting me to come on here and, you know, have this awesome discussion. Again, this was our first time. So, I mean, again, hopefully next time it will be a, a little better. I would actually uh, maybe think in the future we can do one on uh, eschatology. Um, you know, that, that'll be a fun one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, again, awesome uh, time. Um, yeah, just grateful to be here. And again, just thank you for having us. Oh, also, mm -hmm. one more thing. I have a YouTube channel, Let's Talk Apologetics. Check that out. Nice um, it's still new. I got a lot of stuff I'm going to still be putting out. Um, but, yeah, thank you, guys. It was good to meet all y'all. Th thanks for having us on. Um, really appreciate it. Um, yeah. The, yeah, check out his channel, too. Yeah, he's got some good stuff on there. I know we're all, I know we're all on the same page, I think, on the deity of Christ. So, And we, and we love presuppositional apologetics. Uh uh, I, I read a lot, a lot of Greg Bonson's works. You know, I'm trying to get into Van Til, but man, it's a lot of it's so over my head. Yeah, you see what I'm saying, Andrew? Andrew, you're almost there, man. Andrew, he's a grown up here. How can you read Van Til? How can you do a presuppositional apologetic and be Church of Christ? Andrew, I'm playing with fire, dog. Andrew, almost there. Now you. Oh, uh, Andrew got to be now as a post mill. You can do a post mill, Andrew? Yeah. You post yes. mill. I got to do a post mill uh, now. You good. I want to debate good. Jeremiah no, no. on here about post mill, all mill. Trey, I don't want to do that to you, man. You go. Jesus yeah, hits the home run. You have to hit it. I did get you another uh, premium this beat. Uh, That's good. That's good. <laughs>
<laughs> all right guys i'm gonna let you guys know man i really enjoyed you guys appreciate you guys and uh you guys go ahead and enjoy the rest of the evening man and hopefully we can do this again sometime all right guys take care see you boys thank you all right take care bye all right guys another fantastic debate in the books guys i hope you guys enjoyed it all right i hope you guys enjoyed it have fun learn something you know and you know it just you know it, like I, I always say this, right? Uh, when we're dealing with these debates, chances are you ain't gonna walk away with your mind changed, right? You know, we pray to God that, you know, people who are in, that that need to be saved, you know, salvation needs to come to many. We pray that God uses these debates to bring people to himself, right? We pray that these debates are conduits for salvation. And so uh, certainly I, I obviously hope that people walk away with their hearts and minds changed from these debates. Um, and God could very well do that. But, you know, the percentages say that that's not likely that usually people don't walk away with their hearts and minds changed after a debate. But if there's anything that these debates do, it is an encouragement to drive deeper into study. And perhaps God will use those studies to change hearts and minds. Right. And so um, that's what we're hoping that happens. Right. And uh, it, it, this debate was fun, very interactive, very polite. The decorum was excellent. And that's what I expect from these guys, man. So big ups to Trey, Jeremiah, Andrew, and Zachary. So I definitely appreciate them guys for doing that. Um, just that one announcement. Uh, if you guys have not seen the community post on YouTube, it is said, I, I posted up there that uh, Trent Horn has decided not to participate in the in-person debate with Anthony Rogers. Um, and so I am either going to switch it up with a, Two other guys or try to find another great partner with Ant, with anthony rogers because i really do want to do an in-person debate here in 2025 so i'm done to work my my backside off my butt off to try to get that in-person debate done and so um yeah be on the, be on the lookout for any updates concerning that and hopefully we'll be able to get that done because i really want to get one in i haven't done one in quite some time but all that said i thank you guys for joining me and i hope that you guys will have a blessed evening and i look forward to you guys joining me next time on the gospel truth next time it will be jp and cj cox and they will be debating our did god decree all things so hopefully you guys are looking forward to that debate coming up here soon on the gospel truth if you have yet to do so subscribe and hit that notification bell on the gospel truth so you miss any shows interviews and commentaries that are coming up here in the future and just stay locked in man just stay locked in man support the ministry with a like subscribe and share and hit that like on the way out of the live chat please hit that like keep that algorithm going so many people can see this debate all right well that said i'm about to get out of here i thank you for joining me joining us and once again thank you to jeremiah trey zach and andrew for joining me and i hope to see you guys soon take care god bless you guys love you